founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Lead FTF support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of Lead FTS for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Lead FTS has it. Now, onto the show. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. And we're back. (laughs) Here we go. And we're live. Here we are. This is episode 90 of Dave Tate's Table Talk Live podcast. We are with Stan the Rhino Efforting and Matt Wedemer. Uh, welcome, guys. Thank you for joining us here today. What's going on? How you doing? Doing great. That was a great workout we had this morning. It was fun. I figured you out already. You're the instigator. I, yeah, yeah. I, I poked the bear. That's <laughs> or the rhino. We, or we got on a hack squat machine. I'm like, who's done the most? And he's like, who'd you say did eight I plates? said, Te- I was like, oh, our, Ted's done like eight something plates. Done, yeah, he's like, Ted's done eight plates. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking in my head, you know, this is computing. Like, I got up to six and it was heavy as hell. I couldn't do anymore. <laughs> and then after the whole thing was over, you break out. Oh, it was to a box with a reverse band. Yeah, I think it was to a box. <laughs> I think that's what happened. <laughs> I was feeling so bad about myself. <laughs> Damn. Thanks, though. I appreciate the invite. It's great to be on the show. Yeah. Great to finally come out no, here and see you after all these years. Mm-hmm. You know, this is about the first time we've been together. Yeah, it is. It's crazy. Yeah. I was thinking about it. I was talking to Mark last night and I was, and about some other stuff, and I said, yeah. going to be coming out. He's like, you never met him? I'm no, but we know a lot of the same people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, I, I'm a hermit. I don't go anywhere. Yeah. You know, so I, that's what it is. That's all right. It's an amazing gym. It was a great workout today. <laughs> There's so much more we, we could have done, wished we had done, but... Uh, I got to say, most of your audience probably knows who I am, mm-hmm. and, uh, but we got a new face over here today, Matt Wiedemer, and he's uh, not very popular in the social media circles, but behind the scenes, probably one of the most accomplished and smartest guys I know in the industry. He was a former strength and conditioning coach at Pittsburgh and then at, uh, at the Cleveland Browns uh, with strength and conditioning coach for their football team uh, under uh, Buddy Morris, the legendary, yeah. if uh, those in the NFL know, you know he's not insta popular, yeah. but, uh, the great Buddy Morris is a legend <laughs> in the industry. He's, he will know. He is <laughs> popular. That, that shouldn't make me laugh as much as it does. Isn't it funny that people don't even know who that guy no, no, is, no, but, but uh, no, it's just the fact of him even thinking yeah. about being insta popular. Yeah. It's not going to happen. It, it's not going to happen. He, he doesn't use a computer. No. Every but, once in a while, they'll like, like one of my pictures. I'm like, how'd you learn that? His accident. Wife, his <laughs> yeah. wife did yeah. that. Yeah. He, he would write his workouts for the athletes on paper. Yeah. So they come in like, here's your, here's your, here's yeah. your. I mean, it was, Probably still well, does. I'm sure. Yeah. So Matt, uh, he cut his teeth there, of course, and, and he's uh, been a gym owner in Cincinnati for, what, 20 years now. He's owned up to yep. a dozen gyms at one time. and. Still a gym owner down there, worked with a lot of Cincinnati Bengals, and kind of does mostly gen pop now, dad bods and soccer moms, because we know mm-hmm. training athletes is a pain in the ass. But, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, I've trained with a lot of great coaches over the years. Obviously, you know, trained with Flex Wheeler to become a pro bodybuilder and um, Mark Bell uh, for my powerlifting records. But as of late, in the last many years, three, four plus years now, Matt's my go-to guy for powerlifting, probably the most knowledgeable guy that I've ever personally mm-hmm. worked with. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he's a bachelor's uh, uh, strength conditioning, exercise science. And uh, I just want to make sure the audience knows that uh, this is the guy I listen to. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the first guy I called when I got the opportunity to work with John Jones. And we flew him out. We brought out an overspeed treadmill, which is yeah. something he specializes in, the speed strength in particular. And he spent over, what, 15 years working with and competing for uh, Westside Barbell, uh, yeah, like Louis to, Simmons. I used to drive up. I, I'd, ever, uh, I'd come up every Monday, Friday. Yeah. For years. And so I just want to make sure the audience knew uh, that this is, I'll probably be referring to Matt on a lot of these powerlifting mm-hmm. topics. My success speaks for itself, but I, I kind of uh, maybe accidentally happened upon that. I, I can't yeah. say I was the most brilliant guy. Most of the stuff I talk about now uh, is, in, re- is re- in reflection, in retrospect, based on what the science tells us today. I'm like, oh, that's kind of what I did. <laughs> and, and odd, not, huh? Yeah. <laughs> odd. It, was, you know, it wasn't some, some genius uh, guru uh, you know, thing that got me to where I got. It's just that kind of happened to be what worked, and I was around long mm-hmm. enough to fall onto the things uh, or to let go of, of the mistakes that I made over the years. But Probably a better way to just an aside, maybe we'll jump into it today, but Matt's also an extremely successful gym owner. I've been in, in probably 12 countries countries in all 50 states and visited hundreds of gyms and talked to thousands of personal trainers over the years. Uh, not to brag about 
Matt, but he, he runs an extremely successful business that generates over a million dollars a year in personal training, training revenue, not uh, memberships or supplements, but this is actual coaches training actual clients. Uh, and so we wrote a book together on mm-hmm. how to be successful in the fitness industry, which we might talk about in more detail today, but uh, both in terms of his practical experience as a competitive power lifter to his coaching experience and his financial success in this industry. I think this is going to be a great resource. Hopefully we'll touch on some of those topics today. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think we did something a little bit differently today with the videos that we shot, because a lot of the times we'll have guests come out and we have very structured topics that we're going to kind of go over. But mm-hmm. what we did with you guys is we kind of wanted to include the audience in what a training session looks like, right? Yeah. In, in terms of that decision making, in terms of how you guys get from like figuring out what you want to do, feeling how you're feeling for the day, you know, just going through that process. And it's for people that have been training for a long time, that's kind of just what training is. But for a lot of the audience, they might not realize that a training session, you can have a plan, but you need to have those like gatekeepers. You need to have those decision makers that you have, or whether it's in a warm up or an exercise selection or whatever. And we kind of showed that today. And that was kind of cool to see from you guys. He's like, even the decision making, like, all right, we're going to do legs. All right, now. And then we just turned the camera on and went. Right. Yeah. Good. So it was like a really cool thing to see. And it was a different angle on, a, you know, normal training content that you would probably see. So that's going to be exciting to see. Um, yeah. But you hit legs today. Yes. Weird. Indeed. We, yeah. we hit legs <laughs> as often as possible. I don't even like training upper body anymore. It's like every time Matt comes out or I, I join him up, it's, it's leg day. It yeah. doesn't matter. What was leg day yesterday? Well, it's leg day today. <laughs> right. We don't care. It's the only one we really enjoy. It's a, when we're all done, we just sit there in kind of this euphoric state mm-hmm. and, and it, it was leg day and we're going to feel it tomorrow, but it's worth it. So Stan, what are your training goals as of right now? Uh, you know, I just have to stay as big and jacked and as strong as I can until my nine-year-old daughter gets out of high school. I'm not sure. <laughs> I got I to gotta intimidate those little pricks when, uh, when the time comes. She already told me she's in fourth grade, and she's like, uh, she said she's, there's this boy that's talking to her, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to have to beat him up. Not for long. No. <laughs> right. Not for long. That's really no. it. You know, and I've talked about it a lot over the last few years, is that I'm really, my goal now is, is, uh, is to is to be able to train, to enjoy training, uh, uh, injury-free, to be mm-hmm. as, uh, as healthy and durable as possible, as long as possible. So I rehabbed some significant injuries that I talked about, some, well, chronic, I shouldn't say significant, I never had surgery, but uh, knee pain, hip pain, those kinds of things, lower back pain, I've, you know, we've all experienced mm-hmm. it. So now I'm, I'm really trying to be, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention's worth a pound of a cure. So I, I'm really trying to be as, as uh, uh, proactive as possible so it allows me to go in and have these fantastic leg days. If I was all jacked up, I mean, it, it, these would be really disappointing. But uh, everything I do is to make sure that outside the gym is mm-hmm. to make sure that I'm as healthy as possible so I can, I can really pour everything into these. It, it's kind of the highlight of my week, really, is to, to hit these big workouts. Yeah, and, and he's still really strong. I mean, you squat 600 for reps, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like you're weak. With no pain. And that's the key thing. And I don't, you know, I don't wrap up anymore. I don't put knee wraps on and stuff like that. I want my weakest link to be my weakest link. I'm I'm worried about pushing that pain somewhere else. Uh, (laughs) So I I don't lift as much as as, uh, I used to and don't care necessarily. But I I still try and test myself, just not as often. Uh, And again, probably not in such a manner that that I might regret Mm -hmm. uh, the next day or a week later. And and so uh, just to me, just being able to... uh, feel as though I can do this for another 10 or 20 years is what I think really drives me now. And, and then to pass that information on to, to power lifters or bodybuilders or even just guys who had some nagging pains and they get up into their 40s and 50s, I'm like, okay, well, here's what you need to do. And that's kind of the message that I deliver a lot today. Yeah. And it, it, was, a, it was a really cool thing to see. It was like this give and take. You're like, this is where I'm going to press the gas pedal. This yeah. is where I'm going to press the brake. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you just rode that out through the whole session. Yeah. So when it was like go time there at the end, yeah. you fucking brought it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we, we didn't even have to use the fake plates. I was disappointed. We described <laughs> the fake plates here. Yeah. We, <laughs> we described to the uh, audience, you know, the, the, the optimal hypertrophy uh, uh, science as far as uh, where, you know, where you position your legs and your range of motion and the, the knee angle, et cetera. And I do just the opposite because I got to try and keep up with an 800 pound squatter and Jason today. Uh, so next thing you know, my feet are high and outside and I'm loading my ass. And I, <laughs> but hey, it's all for Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Matt, we actually, we, we were nerding out there on, on the side, just like talking about the little nuances. And again, we got all that on camera, which was really, really cool to see. But the, the coaching perspective, you know, it's like how we kind of filtered this training session, which on the outside may look like 
a world's strongest bodybuilder, right? Like powerlifter, right. very strength focused. But we focused it in on, you know, gen pop. We'd focused it in on like anybody that just wants to be a little bit stronger. It's like how, kind of taking those nuggets throughout, right? Well, yeah, because you got to know your audience. So I think, you know, when, in what we do or what my gym does, we have had high-end athletes, but our bread and butter is going to be gen pop. So a lot of times I think, you know, I've lifted with Dave. I've seen Dave do all sorts of crazy stuff to make a meet. Or, uh, you know, I know Stan's gone through pain and hell to mm-hmm. make a meet. And the things that lifters do isn't what gen pop will do. No. no and no, so no. the idea is that you have to tailor this and, and still get people stronger, still get results, but you, you can't hurt them. Mm-hmm. And you can't even give a perception of pain to them. So picking your spots, I think that's why, you know, we like um, using a concurrent model quite a bit because it gives you options where to sub things. If somebody, you know, like on a linear or something like that, uh, on like a linear or a block where it's really structured, that requires the client to mm-hmm. be really structured outside the gym. And if they're not, if they're doing the Butch Reynolds cheeseburger mm-hmm. a day diet mm-hmm. <laughs> and they they can't make a 20 pound jump every week in their mm-hmm. squat or even a five yeah. or 10 pound jump on their bench. So you, we have to be able to kind of get around them, so to speak, mm-hmm. and still get them results. And understand, Matt still strength trains his clients. That's the most Absolutely, effective yeah. method. Mm-hmm. He, it's not uh, Metcons. They don't come in there and, and swing no. battle ropes around. It's not metabolic conditioning. He knows that's not the most effective method to lose weight anyhow. Uh, more cardio does not equal more weight loss. Uh, so he's still strength training him, but he, he's not fixated on, say, a squat bench deadlift. Matt has a board on the wall, and I think this is extraordinary. Most of the times you go into a gym and you see a, you know, a, a, a records board on the wall, and it's just the, the top lifter. Matt has almost every one of his clients, uh, or the vast majority of them, on this board, and he doesn't just have three lifts. It's like 15 lifts up there. There's like all sorts of different maxes. And then when they come in the gym, he tries to f- have them uh, set a record, a PR, in one of those. Sure. And they go up to the board and change it quite frequently. And mm-hmm. that's how, I think that's one way that we as coaches draw people in and, and get them addicted to this process is, even though we know it's neural adaptation initially, it's just yeah, yeah. You have some coordination. But if you pull on a deadlift and you can deadlift 100 pounds, neat, three days later you deadlift 110. Next week you come back and you, you do a double there. Mm-hmm. That's exactly how you tie people in, uh, you addict people to this progressive strength training and it's the most effective in terms of retaining lean body mass when dieting or just in terms of stabilizing the body insulin control for um, you know having the 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 muscle so what matt just described uh, that kind of fills in the the blanks he still brings in people who are who might be up in years uh have had significant injuries or have been somewhat uh uh sedentary and next thing you know these guys and girls and ladies uh are uh, you know, deadlifting 200 pounds, 300 pounds, you know, the, yeah, the, the board's more. amazing. Yeah. And I have to say one thing about that board too. And I shot a video and never posted <laughs> it, but I need to do it someday. Both Matt and Jason walked me up there and every single client, they weren't able to just tell me the person's name that was on the board. They told me their spouse's name, their dog's name, their kid's name, what they do for a living, when the kid graduated, mm-hmm. the yep. wedding they attended. They know everything about their clients. It's, it's 90% psychological and uh, Matt does an extraordinary job of that. Mm-hmm. And that was something, Dave, you used to do when you when you were training clients mm-hmm. as well. You had that book. I remember you mm-hmm. told us a story yeah. on there about yeah. kind of just writing down as much information as them as yeah. possible. Right? I, well, it started because I couldn't remember their name. <laughs> <laughs> right? I actually started because, uh, because of a sales thing. Yeah. And because I only had one or two clients and everybody else I had to get, but I could talk to people on the floor. So I would talk to somebody and they're walking on the treadmill doing their treadmill shit, right? Yeah, yeah. And then I get their name and run back and be, cause we, we did their laundry at the club I worked at. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, Jill, red shorts, purple and green Adidas, Yeah. right? And then I would put that in that book and then they'd all have their own name. And over long story short, over a period of time, I was able to use that to build the relationships to where I would be walking in like, hey Jill, how's it going? How was Tommy, you know, how does the softball game go this weekend? Great, great, great. Then say a month later, it's like, hey, Jill, I just had a cancellation. Is there something that you would like me to help you with? It's, it's on me. You know, let's go to the abs or, you know, whatever it's going to be that they want. That was my way in. So I built the relationship then I could train them. And then is this something you'd be interested in moving forward? Well, of course. Yeah. And within three months, I had 50 billable hours a week yeah. in personal training and a waiting list 
and a book full of all that stuff. So then that just moved into kind of what you're talking about with the board and the record is I had different indicators for everybody, the gen pop, and mm -hmm. it wasn't all strength training. I had, this is a long time ago. So I was using anything I could find. So yes, I used the stupid sit and reach box. Sure. It was an Stamps indicator. Favorite. It was a metric. It's <laughs> yeah, right there. Sure. So, and it was in the ACSM gold book of fucking oh, things, yeah. right? Yeah. So I had that, I had push-ups, I had box squats, I had all the strength training stuff. Um, one minute mi or the, the mile time walking, whatever it was on yeah. the grade. So I had all these things and then I would break them down into four categories. There was um, lion was the top. Then it was like lion, tiger, panther, cheetah or something right. like that. So all I did was to take all the charts that were in the ACSM, ACE and NSCA book because it ranked everything from zero to 100%. I figured, okay, 25 to 100%, that's the lion. Right. And then just built the categories down. And then the very bottom was body fat percentage. And that was highlighted a different color because I had to refer to a registered dietitian because legally I cannot do that. Right. I can educate. But it also kind of gave me an out because they're gen pop. They're not yeah. going to listen to what you're going to say. So here's Allison's card. She's a registered dietitian. Get a hold of her. She'll take care of you. We work together. So when I would take the body fat and it wasn't where it should be, it's Allison's fault. Well, yeah. I mean, when's the last? <laughs> anyway, I would say that. I'm like, yeah. when's the last time that you spoke to Allison? Because yeah. you've gone from, you know, a panther to a cheetah right. on these five things. This here, that's still, yeah. you know, the the beginner or when's, whatever. When's the last time you ate a pizza? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I would have people that would, the goal was to be a lion, right? So if they yeah. move certain number of indicators, I would send a little certificate to their house they can put on their refrigerator and shit like that yeah. and move them all through. But that became the core of the whole training I did with them because it probably like what you're doing now, you got all those indicators on the board. So when they come in, even if you don't really want to write a program, it's like, okay, we need to move these forward. Where are they now? What can we do today to get better in one of these things? Yeah. And keep moving them forward. It's just, mine was a, more than just the strength though. Right. You know, I yeah. wanted, cause they, they needed to do, they needed to walk, they yeah, needed to sure. move, you know? So, and I wouldn't train that, you know, they needed flexibility too, cause they were stiff as hell, but I'm not, I, I wasn't going to be a trainer that's going to sit there and watch them walk on the treadmill for half. Sure. Hour. Nor should you. Or. Yeah stretch them out it's, it's like this is your <laughs> yeah right this is your shit we got a half hour we're going to train we're going to train hard we're going to move these forward and it, it worked really well because my I, I i had a hard time getting clients coming in more like if yeah. they started at two days a week they stayed there right okay. i couldn't get them to three i couldn't if they started at one, which I still, in my mind, it goes back and forth because it's kind of pointless, right? Mm -hmm. But the other part is, well, fuck, it's better than nothing than the other side of my brain says, well, yeah. is it really? Yeah. Is that the Marty Gallagher one, one day a week? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's like, well, <laughs> but if, from a training schedule, though, it's kind of a pain in the ass, though, because it's say terrible. it's Thursday at one, yeah. your normal client might be Tuesday, Thursday. They have a routine, you know, that they want to follow. Yeah. Well, now you just, that Thursday at one fucks up your third or your Tuesday at one. Yeah. You know, so it was a crazy thing, but same type of concept, you know, with that. And it, it's gen pop, you know, so anything right. that you can do to keep them, you got to keep them consistent past the beginner games. Yeah. Well, if, and you hit on something there. You know, you, know, you, you not only said that one day a week might not be effective, neither is uh, like a two month program necessarily because yes. there's yes. no finish line. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have a particular goal that they want to reach and think that that's the end of the deal. And so Matt's been very good about, uh, even up front, just say, look, this is, you know, once you've lost 10 pounds, then what? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to continue to do something to maintain these, you know, to retain your progress. You go right back to where you were. Matt, uh, mostly Matt and I have a, a book out uh, called... Um, uh, building a career and how to build a career in the fitness industry. And we specifically didn't say how to make money in the fitness industry because a career 
it's different. It, yeah, the intention is is that you can you can make a living and buy a home and raise a family, and this is, this is about you making a quick buck. And most of Matt's clients, he has a chalkboard on the wall that has clients that have been with him for three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years. It's all on the walls. These 20. Are 20 years, some yeah. of them. Yeah, I do, you know, because I travel so much, I do mostly online. I don't a lot of uh, hands-on stuff now. I don't develop as deep of a relationship as I used to when I was doing hands-on training, and uh, I don't train them as long as you would if you were engaged with them on a regular basis. But I wanted, Matt, since we're talking about this kind of thing, there's some key components that a personal trainer who wants to make a career in the business industry that you outlined in that book, things that everyone probably should migrate towards yeah. doing in order to be successful and run down the top three or five or whatever. Well, it's funny, listening to Dave, I think the best thing you did was how you talked about setting things home and knowing your clients intimately mm -hmm. because, you know, we have, like Stan said, we do, at this point, a million dollars a year in personal training. Um, I don't do any of the training anymore, but my trainers do. I've never had somebody call and say, like, I'm not sure my kid should be doing bands. He's a raw lifter. Like, no, they, no. <laughs> you know, like, what? <laughs> why, why, you know, no one's like, why aren't we doing a block periodization? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. they do call me and say, I really appreciate your trainer sent me a note or mm -hmm. remembered my anniversary. So it's old line, right? Nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. Text them that evening or the next day and say, how do you feel yeah. about the workout? And so like you sending those things home, even the lion, the cheetah, or mm -hmm. the lion, the tiger, cheetah, that was probably more important. And it's funny because it happens even at a high level when we get a pro athlete. Like when uh, Stan and I went out to train John, it's like mm -hmm. I got this, the force velocity curves. I'm going to show him how overspeed treadmill work. And, no, he don't. He don't and, and Stan said something about like <laughs> hypertrophy, and he's like, what's hypertrophy? No, he don't. And it's not this, and, and the, what we, what I try to explain to trainers is this is for us and you should be a content expert. You should constantly, we, one of the things we talk about is be curious. You should be constantly, we make all our trainers compete in a strength sport. You cannot be a trainer for us if you don't, because that's how you know, like Jason's over there, he's our head trainer, uh, squats 800 raw and knee wraps. And um, I remember when he squatted 720, he hurt his back. And like he was like I watch him come into work. I'm like I don't know how he's gonna like live. He's got two mm -hmm. little boys. I'm like I'm worried about him. He came back and squatted 780 the next meet. If somebody comes to Jason and says like my back's killing me, mm -hmm. and I just want to be normal, that's a layup. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a joke. It's like mm -hmm. oh I came back and broke my squat record. Mm -hmm. You have to push the envelope, but you do it for you and for your knowledge. Mm -hmm. Your client doesn't care. I've never had a client go. Um, you know, Louie thinks you should go. His, his percentages are higher than Matt Wenning's. They don't know who Louie or Ed Cohen came to our gym. No one knew who he was. Yeah. It, it's, it's our world, but you have to care about people and make these relationships. And I think that's the, and I think that's what gets you better results anyway. No, but what the, what I found, obviously I haven't trained clients in forever, sure. but what I found was the, the media is where they were getting their source of health information. Yeah. Right. So that was the, that's what was weird for me because now I had to start paying attention to what was being discussed on the news or the morning America shows or whatever yeah. that other crap was, because I know I was going to get asked about it. Sure. Because they're going to see good morning America or whatever it was. And they're going to come in and say, you know what, this, what do you think about this diet? And I never wanted to be that person that was like, um, I need, I need to look that up. Right. You know, so. And if you're a professional and you've been around, you can see whatever that diet is. And within five minutes, you're like, oh, okay, this is just the slow carb. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you can decide, like programs, right? right. You can look, if, if you're an expert in this field, you can look at anybody's 12 week program and look at it and say, okay, this is block, this is linear, this is conjugate, this is bodybuilding, yeah. or this is just bullshit. bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, right. yeah, it's, it's pretty easy, right? Yeah. So. I don't know how that is today. You know, I'm, I'm probably even worse today. Yeah, sure, I got to so. tell you, when uh, I was studying exercise science at the University of Oregon, I was 20 years old. I took a job at a box gym and uh, trying to do personal training, and then even subsequent to college. But I had to have a full-time job because you couldn't support yourself yeah. on personal training revenue. That is not the case today. And I've traveled all over the world, mm -hmm. and I've met thousands of trainers. Good Life brought me up to Canada to train their trainers. I went from gym to gym to gym and to, to present to a lot of trainers. And, I talked about some of these foundational principles because it's not just about, like Matt said, you, you know, you need to be a master of your craft, you need to have your knowledge, uh, but at the same time, if you can't stay in business, if you can't support yourself, then mm -hmm. you're not going to be of much value to your client. And so, uh, you know, Matt kind of composed some principles uh, in this book that I'm, I still want him to kind of go down yeah. some of the, the big rocks. 
Uh, he uses this as an employee manual for his employees, and if they have a question about you know their marketing or, or their uh, retention uh, of a client, he just refer them to it. And it's something that he's developed and been working for, for years, and is extremely successful. And uh, most of his trainers do over a hundred thousand dollars a year. And gross, yeah. Some of them much more than that. Yeah. Uh, and this isn't like your your two hundred dollar an hour. I live in downtown New York mm-hmm. client. That's this is. Ohio. This is, yeah, this is in Cincinnati, Ohio. This is, my client pays 25 to 35 bucks a session, really. So this is, this is yeah. more normal. This is yeah. more replicable uh, to the, your typical box gym trainer who's struggling to stay in that business and has to work a side job. So run down some of the top things. Well, I think some of the, the big things are, um, one, I always talk about be authentic. And I went to one of your seminars, Dave, and I kind of chimed on it because one thing I think that's made you really successful, one, like, you have simple values, three words, sum it up, right? Mm-hmm. Be who you are. The CrossFit's kind of like, I can't tell you how many things have come and gone in 20 years of owning gyms. And people are like, you can open spinning or you're going to have this. I'm like, no, we do barbell. Yeah, we're training. <laughs> and, and I don't do, and we don't do anything we don't do. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean, so I always say like, if you're into yoga, then do it. Open a yoga mm-hmm. studio. Mm-hmm. And be a, but, but that's really what you should, you should really be about it. Because if you're not, you know, like, we make people train or compete because essentially what we're doing is fixing people with the barbell. If you think about like what all of us do, if somebody came in here and said to Sam, I want to get faster, we'd say, go squat. Mm-hmm. If a girl came in and said, I want to look better, we'd probably say, go squat. And if you said, boy, my knees hurt, we'd probably say, go squat. So at the end of the day, you better know how to squat or teach a squat. So being authentic is number one. I think number two, you, you can't train one-on-one anymore. Mm-mm. It's just a, it's a time killer. I think you need to learn how to train in small groups. Yeah, what's an hour of your time worth and what can the client afford to pay consistently? You can't charge $100 an hour to, a, to the mass population and they won't no. stay with you for an extended period of time. So you're, you're going to have to get more more income out of your hour, but you're going to have to, to share. Uh, you're going to have to have more than one client. Yeah. And I think you got to learn how to sell that. So for us, we'd say, hey, look, it's actually more camaraderie. It's more fun to train with a group. And, you know, I, I, like you, I started one-on-one. It, it's hard. After a couple of weeks, it's like, so uh, <laughs> you got somebody yeah. three, three hours a week. But it's a skill yeah. to do more than one. If you're doing mm-hmm. two or if you're doing six or eight, like Jason could do in an hour, and still make sure that every single person is getting personal attention. Yeah. Nobody's sitting there looking at their watch. That's a mm-hmm. killer right there. It's a skill set. And we've done something that I don't think anybody else in the industry is offering because Matt runs an actual gym yeah. uh, and trains actual clients. Matt has said, if you buy the book and then you want to come out and learn and uh, and shadow his trainers, you're welcome to come out. Just hit him up, DM him. we got contact information in the book. You can come out to Cincinnati and watch Jason work with eight or 12 clients hour after hour after hour for the whole morning that he's there and see how every single person gets now these aren't this isn't uh this isn't group training it's not a class it's not a class these people are actually getting their individual program progressed according to their needs you have an 18 year old and a 60 year old 18 year old high school wrestler boy training with a 60 year old housewife who who was in a car accident at the same time, but not doing the same program because they have individual needs. And Jason can manage that because he's very experienced. Uh, but Matt shows you, and we talk about in the book, yeah. how to manage that. It becomes, it's a skill set. You have to gradually build into that. And we get into the specifics. But for example, if, if somebody's doing a, a heavy squat or a max squat or whatever, you, you spot that. If somebody's doing a plank across the room, you don't have to stand over. Or a lap pull down. You don't need to count reps. Yeah, one arm row, lap pull down. Three more. Yeah. Nine, ten. Let me move that pin for you. And the the reality (laughs) is people think, you know, if you think about we worked out for an hour today, it's not like it's not a cardio class. You know, you did a set, I did a set, Jason did a set, change the plate, do it again. So it's not as if, you know, there's a lot of filler in there. So maybe somebody's, well, I'm spotting Dave on squats. I might have Sam doing one-arm rows. Now Sam yeah. goes over to bench. I might say, Dave, uh, this well, probably would do a power lifter, but you might, if it was GP, General Pop, I'd say, Dave, why don't you lunge down and back mm-hmm. or do 20 side bends on each side while I well, spot, spot Sam. Sam. Yeah, yeah, so you can, but what I always found too was easier. I, was, I said it was like hosting a party, which I'm sure you kind of do this every day when people are always coming to visit Elite FTS. If you didn't introduce us to Sam and everybody else, now the pressure's on you. Mm-hmm. It, it, to entertain everybody. Yeah, yeah, so kind of getting everybody, building a community is really a big part of it where, you know, you're actually getting them. 
it's it's a big benefit in a lot of ways. One, they're not just leaving you. If they were to decide to leave, now they're leaving all the people they go to yeah, work out your with. Yeah, family. You know, it's, I always, you know, um, Panora came down mm-hmm. one time and uh, Phil Harrington, they both went to work there and then uh, they go, this is like a cleaned up West Side. And I said, kind of, you know, if you, if you come in, we do a lot of the same stuff. So it's, it's, but it's more polished, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, black windows. And, yeah. yeah. You know. How about billing? You mentioned you got to train more than one person an hour. How do you set up billing so that you have fewer drop offs? You got you to go auto pay. Yeah. It's funny. We should bring Jason over and tell a story. Auto pay came from two things. Number one, I hated, I don't know about you, Dave, I hated tracking sessions. You know, somebody buys 50 sessions and they're like, oh, I thought I had seven left. And you're like, uh-huh. no, you yeah. have six. And you're like, auto. So one year I just said, I'm done. It's, you know, we did 450, 400 a month. You come as much as you want. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Whenever you want. That's another Whenever. thing. You don't have to worry yeah. about scheduling. Because if you can train six or ten people right. in any given hour, then come in what's convenient to you, and you're not like, oh, you're late. So one of the traders was like, oh, you're crazy. You're going to kill your per session average. I said, I don't think so. I said, one, I don't care. Two, I don't think so. And then, you know, snow hits, sick days. Yeah, wintertime, Thanksgiving, holidays, Christmas. People stop vacations, showing up. Yeah. Vacations. I mean, even mm-hmm. now with, with Corona, I don't know if you guys mm-hmm. have heard of Corona, mm-hmm. but... Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the beer, right? The beer? Yeah. yeah. got to beep that out so we don't get uh, back checked here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now if somebody's like, oh, you know, we got a quarantine, I'm like, all right, come back when you're ready, but we don't lose any revenue. Mm-hmm. Right. With the Knights. And they win because if they show up more, you know, sometimes somebody does beat you, and it's like, so what? They're in great shape. They're a mm-hmm. great customer. They're a walking billboard. Great. Beat me. Yeah, referrals. That's huge. Yeah. And then I think the other thing is uh, – you know, nobody, like uh, those dying top so say, no one cares about your sumo deadlift. No. No, nobody cares. You're on, I think you got to learn how to go business to business and, and knock on doors to build your clientele. I see so many people, I was telling Sam, you know, they'll, they'll post on, you know, here's my sumo deadlift. DM me. DM me if you're interested in pre- It's like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh, sure. only three spots left yeah man. i rolled with that for a while look and if you want to do social media marketing and become the you know the next social media guru yeah. that's fine there's people that do mm-hmm. that i've mm-hmm. had a very successful business there i would never you know deter anybody from from trying that but i had the good fortune of a lot of publicity over the years mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't have in magazines and youtube videos and on fucking shark tank mm-hmm. and, you know, so I understand that, and I'm not going to tell somebody who nobody knows that they could as easily accumulate mm-hmm. clientele as I did. But for the most part, your clients live within five miles of your gym, and there's a lot of them, and damn near everyone's a client. You know, we got 70% overweight and obesity in this country, and the rest of them yeah. probably are getting Everybody's poor sleep or are tired from lack of energy and, or might have a, uh, you know, a, a physical goal, a sports of some sort. Uh, everybody's a client. It's, it's funny to be around Matt because he's the consummate salesman. He has a whole chapter in the book on how to uh, uh, design a script and to practice it and rehearse it so it becomes natural and how to utilize it and how to approach clients and how not to just hand somebody a business card and think that that's closing the deal. It's, it's, it's right. absolutely worthless. Nobody calls you. Do they even exist anywhere? No. Business cards? Yeah. And, and, uh, oh, anywhere I go with Matt, whether it's a restaurant or a grocery store, it doesn't matter. The gas station, he's like tapping on the, the, the guy next to us at the, at the pump. He's like, so, hey, yeah, where do you train? <laughs> and he's open up. Next thing you know, he's got phone numbers, and that yeah. guy is calling, and, uh, and he's closing deals right in front of me. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, this guy's just a master. But he just asks. He's confident enough mm-hmm. to ask for the sale, which is a key component of I th- getting I think business. the thing we, you know, we talk about, one of, our, one of our core values is be curious. And that applies to your training, right? You should constantly push the envelope, trying to get better, learn more stuff. But it applies to others. I think, you know, I know my story. You know, Dave's got a really interesting story. Um, it's been told you have an interesting story I mean, I know about you and your mom working in the bakery and mm-hmm. you know how you grew up working at the 7-Elevens and, and you went out and got bigger because you worked on your Amish farm it was your uncle's yeah. Amish farm yeah uh, people are fascinating in the most interesting thing people like to talk about is themselves yeah and get to know people it's a it's it's a lot better way to live one I think you'll get more friends more enjoyable life but two I can't help you if I don't know anything about you we're solving problems right you know, like everybody at this table probably has something. Probably Sam, you probably have something you want to achieve. I know Stan needs bigger calves. But, <laughs> but, but whatever, it, whatever it is, I don't know unless I get to know you and find out about you. Yeah. And even generating referrals, if you know, the, like I'm sure you did the same thing. It's like, well, you're always talking about your your girlfriend. Why don't you bring her in? Yeah. You know, or oh yeah, mm-hmm. I should. 
and then you got to and you got to follow through. Say, oh, well, you know, nowadays we, you didn't have text back then, but I'll just say like, oh, group text us right now. We'll get it started. You know, take action. I think in all business, um, people want to be helped. They really they do. do. They, they do. want you to 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 take control and and help them meet that goal. But you don't know what their problem is or what their goals are unless you ask. Yeah. A lot of people they want to go up and immediately tell you their credentials. Oh, I have a you know a bachelor's uh, of science and a, yeah. a powerlifter, and then they don't care. Mm -hmm. What you have to find out is what they want, who they are, what they mm -hmm. need. And uh, Matt's very good about that. And uh, I'm just amazed at how much people will tell you if, if you're interested and ask about them. Yeah. And then you utilize that to provide them a solution to their problem. And our solution, obviously, is, is uh, going to be in the gym training. And I think you uh, have to take the approach that you're not the show. You know, I think that's a thing that trainers a lot of times think they're the show. You're not the show. It's about the customer. And I always, you know, you, I always think of it this way. You, you got to be on because like in our business, some pay, people pay us $450 a month and uh, our trainers do a great job. Any of the trainers we've had to let go of in part of that process, of letting them go, I'll say, Hey, you really weren't on today. And they're like, well, you know, my girlfriend was bothering me or this. And I'm like, well, what if the client said this month I'll pay you 360. I don't feel like, you know, it's like <laughs> they paid full price, give them the full service, and, and you're a service provider, and it's not for everybody. Mm -mm. You know, we, we learned that coaching, uh, you know, pro athletes. It's, it, we're, the, well, we're, we're not the show. I'll even tell you a specific story. So I've been away from doing one-on-one -on -one training for quite a while. I've been doing a lot of online training, but I, I, I cut my teeth on one-on-one -on -one training for, for a couple of decades there. And so we're down there training John and uh, John Jones, and he wants to do ab work after every – uh, after every session, after every mm -hmm. MMA session in the evening. And I'm talking about like flutter kicks and, and, and this stuff. Yeah. And so I'm in there explaining to him that that doesn't work, that doesn't build core and blah, blah, blah. And Matt's like elbowing me. And I'm like, oh, what? He goes, look, if you don't do it for him, he'll find somebody who will. And so then you try and get them what they want but incorporate things that you know mm -hmm. work better, so it's all yeah. part of the same request. And that's when you know we're adding suitcase carries and those kinds of things to you know to actually work the core and med ball throws. But uh, but you got to do some flutter kicks. We would do three hundred different yeah. uh, flutter kick type exercises yeah, after <laughs> crunches. Yeah. And I mean, I was my stomach was sore as hell, but I knew it was worthless for the for actually for, <laughs> for the core <laughs> as it may be. Uh, but that's you know, that's what you do, and sometimes it takes time, uh, you know, when you, you provide the education uh, over time rather than just trying to just come in there and tell them what what they well, you gotta, need. You got to build that trust. Hundred right? percent. So if say he mm -hmm. thinks that works, right? Yeah. So now you're saying it doesn't. You're already breaking mm -hmm. that bond of trust. Where when I will consult with coaches in regards to the development of their plan. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have glass tables. Is I'll have them start writing. So it's the same me and you were talking about training. Yeah. And you wanted help. We're going to start talking about everything that you think works for you. Right. You've been doing this for how long? You know, 80 yeah. years, 50 years, 40 yeah. years. A long, a long <laughs> fucking time, <laughs> right? Time. So you've been doing this for four decades probably. You know, maybe more. You know, a long time. Yeah. There's a lot that you immediately know, nope, not for me. Right. Yep, for me. I want to know what that is. So if we start, if I'm working with, collegiate coach and we just start mapping all that out and the way i like to explain it i can fill three quarters of this table so once we fill three quarters of the table then the conversation shifts to say you came here looking for consulting on training advice but you already got 70 percent of this figured out mm -hmm. so let's not erase the table and start with a blank slate don't go to anybody that's going to tell you to re -erase your, re erase your table and start with a blank slate i don't care who it is i don't care if it's you know, Louie, or if it's, you know, there's certain people that, rep, or Jim, if certain people represent different training methodologies. Yeah. Louie's West Side, Jim's 531, nothing, uh, Ripito's starting straight, nothing against those guys. Mm -hmm. But that's their philosophy. Don't expect that they're gonna change their philosophy. Right. Right. But if you go to a lot of these guys and you don't keep your mind open, they will indirectly, I don't think they do it on purpose, want you to erase the whole table. Yeah, and then start with everything that they think. I think that's wrong, especially yeah. if there's 20, 30 years. Yeah. Like, let's figure out the 30% that you don't know. And if I can't help you there, 
I can tell you who can. Yeah. So let's figure that out and make the table full yeah. where that ties right back into what you're saying is, so with John Jones, 70, part of that 70%, yeah, it might be a little, it might be a little off. It could be dialed in, it could all be dialed in. Yeah. But it's not worth erasing when we still have that 30% to fill. Right. Let's fill that, then when the table's full, let's audit the things on the table and yeah. start. And I like something you said, Dave, you give them respect. Cause I've said that to him, I said, look, you got 15, you, you're 27 and 0, I'm 0 and 0. Yeah. yeah. You got to respect that he's stepped up 27 times and 27 times yeah. he won. So yeah, yeah, it's not terrible. Said, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And we can yeah. write out the greatest program in the world, but if we can't actually uh, implement or execute that program. Uh, when I first sat down with John, uh, the, I, I had written out a whole lot of stuff that I had intended uh, or, th or just felt from, mm -hmm. from my experience that we'd be implementing. But the first page on my notebook when I opened it up was blank. And I said, John, this is your page. And I sat down and asked him, I said, how do you envision yourself winning this fight? And, and what do you think you need to get there? Mm -hmm. And he just started talking. And he was animated. And he stood up. And he was moving around. And he was showing me exactly what he wanted to do. And it was just coming to life. And I was just writing. This is what John needs. Mm -hmm. This is what John mm -hmm. wants. And then I could flip the page. And I was already most of the way there. I'm like, OK, this is how we're going to do that. You have your goal, I have the path to get there. And so he's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can see that. And so we could start to get him to, to the end, show him the, the means to get there. And that, yeah. was, that was critical, but let your client tell you yeah. what they want. Uh, and then you gotta start asking the questions you, you mentioned earlier in terms of diet and exercise. I had said, oh, you want him to lift weights. I've always said the best diet's the one you'll follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the best exercise is the one you'll do. And so that's where you start. Yeah. You know, what will this person do consistently? And then can you start to incorporate things or even give them uh, things that they weren't even aware of that might, they might enjoy, both mm -hmm. in terms of foods, methods of dieting, whether it be, uh, you know, intermittent fasting or keto. Maybe they yeah. maybe they enjoy that. Maybe they'd feel better there. You don't know. I, I, I'm not, yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't care. Uh, and same with the exercises, because we have such a, a large palette of exercises. Start introducing them to other options. Like, oh, that feels good. I still do that. We did that today. No, no. Yeah. We tried about four different machines. Yeah. Oh, I like this one. And that's how our day started today. Just, we just walked around. We knew kind of what we were going to do, but we wanted to, to pick yeah. the exact exercise that felt great. We tried a, a, a few different hack squats and leg presses first. So oh, this one feels good. Try this one. And we kind of honed in on that one. And sure. then everything went to hell from there. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. It, and that process I, is so important for people to realize that happens. I mean, between you guys, that was just kind of mm -hmm. how you communicate. Mm -hmm. But that takes years and years of experience to realize like, okay, this is the goal. And these are the tools that we have at our disposal. What is the best way to facilitate that goal for that day at that time for that person? Yeah. And like, that's where that skill set or that experience, like you had said, all your coaches are compete. They have to. They have to, right? Yeah, so, that's part of our deal. So at the end of the day is if you are in a position where you cannot better facilitate the growth of that person in front of you, like it doesn't matter the programming prowess that you have, like you have to create whatever that person needs at that time, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the big thing about competing is twofold. Number one and Dave, you got a, you have so many strength coaches in here. I can't stand people who like use piss poor coaching and their excuses. Well, we're not power lifters. It's like, well, you're teaching the squat, so like, mm -hmm. could you, like their their de facto default when it's like that's terrible is like, well, we're not power lifters. No, but they'll be the first to tell you that the power lifter has shitty mobility, right? <laughs> and, but the power lifter can't say, well, we're not athletes. Yeah, I mean, like you, you get what I'm saying. So it works right. both ways. So that's how I deal with that. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a good comeback. But it's funny. <laughs> because, and the other thing that um, I had a coach say to me once, I said, have you ever thought about powerlifting? He's a smart guy, and he's uh, well, well respected in our field. But I, he said, oh, it's so one-dimensional. I'm like, so sprinting. Do you not think Hussein Bolt's impressive? <laughs> like, but it, what it is is they think it's so easy. It's like, well, then go do it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like, let's see how you do after a year, two years, five years. Yeah. If it's so easy to be a bodybuilder, go be a bodybuilder. I mentioned earlier during our workout, there's no such thing as functional training. No. It doesn't exist. There's weight classes for a reason. You know, whatever sport you're involved in, if you can get bigger, stronger, and faster, not always bigger if there's weight classes, but sure. certainly stronger and faster, 
uh, you're going to perform better at that sport. Mm -hmm. Who was it that uh, the tennis player came out and talked about all his weightlifting? And Jim Courier. Jim Courier was smashing everybody for years, and he comes out and says, oh, yeah, I just weightlift. We well, did a Nike commercial. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. all the other tennis players started weightlifting and started smoking him. <laughs> well, I always kind of wondered, like, like, at what point in time did the squat become non-functional? Yeah. Like, how, how is the deadlift not functional? Right. Do you not pick shit up every day? But you know what that is? It's, it's an excuse from a bad strength coach to say, oh, well, we do functional training. It's like. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, the, yeah, right. we can go down a rant right here. Yeah. Right. What, do, what is that? Picking right. exercises exactly. that are, that are, well, that are yeah. more please, close please to define their it. sport. And then I know you've read all these books. But, but is that functional or is so that sport it's specific? Effective. It's not <laughs> effective. But what's funny is sport cases. specific by definition, not our you know, by the true definition, has to match velocity, I know. velocity <laughs> direction, duration. I know. So I had somebody once say, like, oh, I can't remember what we had the guy doing. And, and this guy was in a functional training. It was these tennis guys. And, like, I've never seen Roger Federer do that. I said, I've never seen a BOCE ball on the court either. So yeah, what, yeah. I just I, like to play the game the with. Move. I just like to to play the game. It's not really a game, I suppose, because there are a lot of people that I've met over the years that are what you would consider big into that, right nor wrong. Yeah. I just want to know how they define it. Yeah, well, yeah. You, it's you not know, like defined. what? Like, tell me what you. It's another thing that I talk about with training is volume. Like people will define yeah. that. May if we're to talk about volume, yeah, I can't have this conversation until we both ag all agree. Yeah, are we talking about workload sets times reps times weight, right? Or are we talking about sets times reps, right? Because to me, sets times reps is volume, right? Sets times reps times weight is workload. That's yeah. textbook. Right. So right. a lot of people will say workload is volume, and so it's, now the conversation right. gets all fucked up. Then we get right? junk volume. Well, yes. Yeah, so then you get, get into all these different things, so right? Yeah. Where they're like, well, yeah, I like to really push the volume high. And I'm like, okay, so is that like workload? Like, mm -hmm. what are we talking about here? Because volume to me, like you could do 10 sets to 10, a side raise is a 15 pounds. Yeah. Is, you know? <laughs> well, just like <laughs> you, know you said. Saying? That's, yeah, that's 100 right. reps, right? We're, 100 reps there is completely different than 100 reps at 70% on the squat. 100%. Right. You defined it as it should be defined. Yes. We cap that off. It's sets times reps times weight. And I want to, Matt to repeat for the audience, for those people who, who are unfamiliar, uh, again, what is functional training? Matt, you said it was three things. It has to be three things. Well, sport specific is duration. Or sport specific. No, sport specific. Yeah. Sport specific. Yeah. Sport specific yeah. training. Yeah. Yeah. Duration, velocity, and uh, direction. Mm -hmm. Duration, velocity, and direction. So you have to make sure that you're, you're meeting that criterion for the specific sport. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it's funny because you, even years ago, right, we had talked about how I, I, I trained baseball players sure. even when I was playing. Yeah. At the time, one of the things that coaches would have you do is they would have you swing a weighted <laughs> bat. Yeah. And how <laughs> fucking stupid is that? Yeah. Right. right. Now we know. It's like, all right, we're going to, you play tennis, weighted tennis racket. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right? right. And it's just right. the idea of if you're training in the gym, if you follow those parameters, it should help you benefit on the court or on yeah. the field a, or whatever. A 10 pound med ball for free throws. <laughs> well, that's why we started, <laughs> right. that's why we started using overspeed training because you're like, Louie always talk about. Um, you know, that's what I came up with when I was 19. So it, it, the Olympic guys, like the Olympic lifts, that's going, what, like a meter, 0.8 to a meter a second. Speed squats are 0.8 to a meter a second. And I'm like, well, these guys are running 10 to 12 meters a second. That's not speed to them. So we started pushing the overspeed treadmills as a method to really work. That would be sports-specific speed training. It doesn't, it's not like we don't use speed training in, in our weightlifting but it, or powerlifting or strength training, whatever you want to call it. But it, I would laugh when the Olympic guys are like, oh, our velocity curve. I'm like, you're in a meter a second. Bolt's running 12 and a half. <laughs> how, how do you equate that to it, – it, it's not that I – if you like Olympic lifting, great. And if you like, you know, but they're not right in mm -hmm. what they're trying to define. They're right. using the wrong terminology. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it is. It's, I mean, we've – me and Dave have sat down and talked about that quite a bit. Is If you're going into the situation without the – the yeah. terms in agreement, <laughs> right, yeah. then you're just not, then you're just talking in circles. And that's pretty much what happens on the internet most of the time. People just fucking talking in circles and shit. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like who's more right or who's less wrong. Right. But a, it's, yeah. a lot of these terms have been so diluted over the years, though, that there's still a lot of knowledge in the diluted term from the person that you're speaking to because that's all they have always known. So to me, it's a matter of let's just get on the same page mm -hmm. on these basic definitions, or at least just tell me what you think it is, and I'll adjust my thinking. 
for that because people will say, and I don't want to name people, but there's very prominent people in the strength industry that are really wrong on how they use a lot of definitions. I mean, very wrong to the point where a lot of people are like, I oh, just fucking idiot. Like maybe you ought to just like figure out why they're defining it that way. Then listen to the other 80% of what they're talking about. And this motherfucker's a genius. He's been doing it for 45 years, producing high level athletes just because he didn't go to college to learn the proper definitions and has been living on rubber grass and, you know, right, yeah. <laughs> turf for 40 years. Doesn't mean he doesn't know what he's doing. In contrast, he does, right? Because he's been doing, he's got hundreds of thousands of hours or whatever it is yeah. of experience and you're criticizing because he doesn't understand the proper term for workload well matt talked about this earlier <laughs> when we were, we were over here training matt talked about this earlier he said that uh, a lot of folks will will implement their their three basic movements doing a linear progression uh until they get hurt Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've all been there and just it just I just wait I'm patient I've been at this for 35 plus years I've seen all of the gimmicks come and go mm -hmm. all these fancy programs seen them and come and go a couple times now come and go a couple times now <laughs> re-emerge on TikTok <laughs> and I just I just wait I'm patient I, I, I see this all the time it's just, as soon as they get injured next thing you know they're doing a whole variety of of, uh, yeah, that's right. of uh, similar uh, exercises and doing a whole whole lot more uh uh, you know, 70% load volume and uh, yeah. just, uh, it, you, you see it happen. Or you watch the flashes in the pan that talk about their program and then, uh, you know, 10 years later, they, just, poof, mm -hmm. they disappeared. Why? Well, they've accumulated so many injuries over that short mm -hmm. period of time that they can't compete anymore. So, hey, Dave, you'd like this. We, Jason and I, uh, our head trainer over there, went to a seminar and I uh, won't say who, but it, it was for like performance and it turned into a Bash Louis Simmons seminar. Oh, that's great. And uh, I'm just sitting there. One was, I told uh, Stan this, you know, I read a lot of these books that people quote. I don't want to say it to brag, it just did. Yeah, yeah. So the one guy gets up and starts talking about, you know, as one thing goes up, one thing goes down. I said, that's Charlie Francis's vertical integration. The guy's like, oh, good question. Too good, too good a question. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is funny because it's like, you don't have to. It, you can just say where you got it. It's not, mm -hmm, like, you know, yeah. none of us are Christopher Columbus. Mm hmm but then all those guys are out of the sport. They're all All injured. those guys who were killing Louie, mm -hmm. and they were out of the sport, you know, bad out of the sport. Well, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of reasons why they're out of the sport, though, because... These were injuries. Uh, yeah, I mean, take anybody that's calling anybody in the industry kind of out by name yeah. for whatever they're doing. Those people don't last long. Never. Right? So anybody that's attacking anybody that's trying to make their building bigger by taking others down mm -hmm. never last right they can still make their point in that presentation without bashing somebody else yeah. just make your point right just say what you want to coach say what you want to say yeah. get rid of the filler that you're just trying to use to garner attention because what typically happens is not everybody in that audience is going to be like yeah fuck louie or yeah fuck ripito or right Half of them are like, that's fucked up. Yeah. Like, what's the point of this? Right. Yeah. So you just alienated mm -hmm. half of your audience. Right. Just for something that's unnecessary. Yeah, I said that, at lunch, I said that oftentimes I have to qualify agreeing with something that somebody said yes. with, I don't agree with everything. They well, that, said. I mean, that kind of should be a given though, right? Uh, agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and I don't expect everybody to agree with everything I yeah. say. What works for me might not work for you. And what mm -hmm. works for most people probably doesn't work for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you said earlier, you said about uh, asking someone what works for them. Oddly enough, in my questionnaire that I give to my clients, I ask them, what do you think works for you? And if I can't come up with a really good reason why it actually hurts their performance, I leave it alone. Even though I mm -hmm. don't, even though I know the science will say that it's just placebo, mm -hmm. I don't fuck with it. The guy mm -hmm. thinks it works for him. Placebo is powerful. It's real. It, mm -hmm. it, it works. Mm -hmm. And so I just leave it alone. I don't have to go in there and be like, oh, well, this study says this. Uh, yeah. You know, the other it, question to ask is what didn't work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because as soon as you throw that out there, their brain is just going to recall, oh, mm -hmm. didn't work. I put that in there yeah, as well, yeah. and I don't recommend it unless yeah. uh, unless it's compelling that that uh, you know I find a way that uh, maybe they were doing it wrong yeah. and it, it would. And most them. likely they were not doing it right. Yeah. So there was some disconnect. Placebo is important. Yeah. 
So I think now would be a good time to kind of shift gears a little bit. We have mentioned uh, consistency. We've mentioned uh, longevity. I know we've gotten a lot of questions from our audience specifically. Stan, you've obviously done quite a bit of work in terms of diet, nutrition, and, and kind of those big rocks in terms of um, increasing performance and health markers and whatnot. I think what I kind of want to go into right now is our audience roughly has been training for about two to five years. They want to get a little bit stronger. They want to look better naked, right? What are some of the bigger rocks in terms of either nutritional marker, uh, like blood markers, any of that, it, yeah. that, you, that you feel yeah. as if are probably some of the more important things to focus in on first and foremost as that foundation. I'm a broken record. And it's one of the things <laughs> that I, it frustrates me so much that I can't, you know, I, I can't wave my pom-poms about something obscure. <laughs> it's the same thing. I keep repeating myself. I see comments. Stan says the same thing every time. Well, that's because that's what fucking works. And so, <laughs> and I also said in another video, look, there's nothing extraordinary about anything I say, but are you doing it? Mm -hmm. You know, show me, everybody wants to show me every set and rep and everything they've ever done. Show me your hours of sleep. Show me how many, how many calories or protein you've consumed. I'm more interested in, in those kinds of those consistent Recovery things. Recovery so, modalities. Exactly. Uh, I think most of my success, I, I, I think the majority of us train pretty hard. I really mm -hmm. do think that. Uh, unless you're, you know, some mankini competitor or something like that, it could be different or, or the old, uh, pre-contest, uh, raise your reps, lighten your weight sort of folks, you know, uh, but they don't count. But That's some old school shit. It's right an old there. school shit. <laughs> I, at least I think we've learned better that, uh, you know, you really do have to have some degree of intensity and I think we enjoy it more mm -hmm. for those people who stay in the sport. I think we enjoy, uh, you know, that, that intensity really, really uh, dumping ourselves in the gym. Most people train hard. I think what that they lack possibly is outside the gym, uh, the recovery, because it's not exciting, uh, but it really prepare, obviously recover from and prepare for the next bout. And that bout should be superior to the prior bout. Otherwise it's exercise, not training. There has to be mm -hmm. some progression. Sets times, rep times weight is really mm -hmm. what it comes mm -hmm. down to uh, over time. And uh, so I'm, I focus right back on the big rock is gonna be sleep and optimizing sleep, not just the quantity, but the quality. Uh, and I have a whole, uh, that's why my, my, my book is not, it's the vertical diet, but it's not just nutrition. I taught, mm -hmm. uh, you know, each chapter is everything that I want my clients to do. And I start there and I have, I've had big athletes, Hofthor Bjornsson, Brian Shaw, over 400 pounds, snore like freight trains, not wearing CPAPs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Lane Johnson, Philadelphia Eagles, over 300 pounds, not wearing a CPAP. You know, these guys mm -hmm. have apnea and it has a major effect on their recovery. Obviously their huge. blood sugars has a huge effect on their blood pressure. Uh, so those, the rhythm, yeah. I mean, there's so many other, a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> the, their blood thickness, mm -hmm. kind of a quick aside here. Uh, we've had some athletes, uh, you know, some, some high profile athletes over the last few years. And you and I have seen them for decades now. It's just going to not been as popular, but now it's, uh, as we see the more popular athletes, uh, in social media, uh, we've seen some pass away mm -hmm. and it's led us to believe that there's, uh, something, uh, awry going on amongst, uh, our industry of bodybuilders and powerlifters and strongmen. Uh, there was a really good, uh, research report done on this. Uh, Greg Knuckles talked about it in a recent podcast where somebody had done, uh, had, had taken a look and compared bodybuilders and powerlifters to the general population. And it appears as though there isn't, uh, uh, a significant, uh, uh, what you call a statistical increase in bodybuilders dying as composed to the general population. I don't think that's good news because cardiovascular disease obviously is our number one killer and the vast majority of our population is overweight and obese and has you know, type two diabetes. Uh, and, and we're supposed to be a, a you know, health oriented bodybuilding you know, to some degree. Mm -hmm, and, I, mm -hmm. and I understand that uh, you know, I, I did a video uh, on YouTube called "If You Want to Be Healthy, Don't Compete." I get it. Well, yeah, that's, uh, we're excluding it, that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a different group of folks. Yeah. The primary drivers of that, though, once I dispel the myth that that people are dropping like flies because they bodybuild, because the vast majority of people are are doing just fine, uh, is uh, high blood pressure and blood thickness, and those are probably the two leading like kill you now. Mm -hmm. Uh, problems and the majority of these people as we think through the names and we all know them and I, I, won't, I won't highlight them here today they were off season they were at a pretty heavy weight 270 to 80 300 plus pounds uh, and I know a few of them many of them personally had uh, sleep apnea didn't wear a CPAP had a prior condition 
um, uh, you know, a predisposition, whether it's a genetic predisposition. We even saw this with uh, who was the biggest loser coach uh, that had a heart attack. Uh, his name's escaping me right now, but he was in extraordinary shape, but he had a familial uh, mm-hmm. uh, history of, of heart disease. So um, Bob Harper mm-hmm. was his name. Yep. Yeah, if you were looking at it. Just looked up. it up, yep. Uh, anyhow, going through a whole lot of stuff here just to give some people some general background. So one of the things I've recommended in addition, obviously, to sleep and sleep apnea and getting a CPAP, even if you can't go get a sleep study and you can't afford that process, I've been telling people to go on Craigslist and buy a dream yeah. station off Craigslist or find one of those sites that'll sell you one and I have links in my book yeah. uh, without the need of a prescription because it's that important. And the drawbacks are, as far as I understand them to be, uh, almost non-existent. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't recommend somebody usurp uh, you know, the, the proper pathway through a medical practitioner if, if there was uh, significant side effects, says the guy using performance enhancing drugs <laughs> yeah, for yeah, 30 yeah, years. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend it to yeah, others. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, that, that's pretty significant uh, for uh, aiding with blood pressure and blood thickness. And then uh, I do a blood test. And I've talked about this for years, which is a good opportunity for me. And I just pulled my phone up here because I wanted to make sure and, and read this out. I just recently, and for I think people know, I've talked about it before, I've done well over 100 blood tests. And I did them almost monthly throughout uh, the later part of my competitive career just to kind of see how much damage I was doing to myself mm-hmm. or, or what uh, interventions I used that per- mitigated some of those problems. And uh, I always did it online. Mm-hmm. And more recently, this company popped up, uh, uh, Smokey from Mark Bell's group up there at Super Training, reached out to me about this company called MerrickHealth.com, M-A-R-E-K, Health.com. And their prices are half the price of what I used to pay, which is extraordinary. And so I put together this, and, and so I reached out to them and I asked them to put together a, a panel that has all the blood tests that I usually use with my athletes and to give them a consultation from a medical professional uh, with that. That could be almost a $400 expense. It's probably a barrier to entry for a lot of people. That's, it's still cheaper because it's, I've always used direct labs. Yeah. So I'm paying, I don't want to tell you what I pay for my blood work. (laughs) I I, I did too. I paid (laughs) $700 sometimes. Yeah. 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 I found a budget panel that was still almost 300 that I used to pay. Uh, Just didn't have everything. Uh, And so I put together that panel, but that's still expensive for some mm-hmm. people. When I mean, we were bodybuilders and powerlifters, after all, what, what do you? Well, that my, my cost is before I see Serrano, so that's I'm still got to see my doctor. Right, exactly. So I got to still pay for that. Yeah, it's a good time to to toss a joke in here. So what do you what do you call a bodybuilder without a girlfriend? Homeless. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I know my clients, right? I'm mm-hmm. I'm one of them. I'm a meat neck at heart. I, I, I've lived this all my life. So anyhow, real quick. Uh, so I put together this budget panel. I went onto their website and I just compared what I paid to what they're charging. And this isn't a, a sales pitch here. Yeah. It's less than half. Here's a budget panel that I put together that's $102. If What's, you, what are the markers? If you can't spend that. C-reactive protein, your metabolic panel, your comprehensive metabolic panel, which has a host mm-hmm. of, of studies in there. Testosterone, free and total. Prostate-specific antigen, a urinalysis, a CBC with differential and platelets, HA1C, iron, a full iron panel a lipid panel uh, uh, with LDL-HDL ratios, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, insulin, ferritin, uh, uh, estrogen, all of that is included. It's a reasonably comprehensive D? profile. I did not put vitamin D on there. Uh, I put it down here under also recommended. Okay, okay. Uh, that was just kind of a, because uh, I kind of recommend 4,000. I use a vitamin D to everybody. Yeah. Anyhow, mm-hmm. And it satisfies it, uh, I think. But I have some others I mentioned down here. If you have particular... Uh, concerns with the the initial test, like if your LDLs are through the roof, then maybe gotcha. throw in an ApoB test. If you if you've got gout or high blood pressure, throw in a uric acid test. If you've got erectile dysfunction, throw in a prolactin test. Uh, particularly if you're on uh, uh, performance enhancing drugs, and then a more comprehensive thyroid panel if you see something there. But 102 dollars and 33 cents at Merrick Health for a reasonably comprehensive profile that I'd like to see if somebody contacted. Did, did me. that have AST and ALT? It is. That's okay. part of it. So that's in there. It, yeah. So yeah, that's that's for a hundred bucks. That's covering almost everything. It, it's covering a lot. Yeah, that's for sure. So I just wanted to throw that out there that uh, folks can do that with Merrick Health. So that kind of breaks down. What I'm saying is, there's no excuse. No, there's not. I've I've been saying that forever. Check there, your there's blood really pressure. Not. <laughs> in my book, I have a high blood pressure quick fix kit, which is extraordinarily uh, effective. It goes down all of the most important things that can reduce your blood pressure significantly. Obviously, weight loss. But a lot of powerlifters aren't interested in losing weight. Uh, I've had a lot of powerlifters who I did not. Uh, asked them to lose weight because they had a, a pending competition, but they had elevated blood pressure. I was still able to bring that down. 
Lane Johnson weighed 312 when I got to, with him, and his blood pressure, his systolic blood pressure was in the 150s. I got him up to 333. His blood pressure was in the 120s. Sleep apnea is a big one. Hypothyroidism was a big one. Getting sufficient uh, micronutrients such as potassium and magnesium and calcium were pretty big for that. And then the 10-minute walks after meals uh, brings down postprandial glycemia, mm -hmm. which is a big contributor to blood pressure anyhow, is just a, yeah. a hyperinsulinemia. So those were the big ones, the big rocks that allowed him to gain weight and improve his uh, cardiometabolic markers. So that's a big piece of it. So we did the sleep, we do a blood test, uh, and then I just kind of mentioned some of the keys for hydration. Uh, and this is whether it's an athlete or whether it's a dad bod or soccer mom, I'm, I'm looking at, at uh, about a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass or goal weight, uh, about 30% of total calories. Recent study just came out that compared uh, the Mediterranean diet to a high protein diet, which I don't classify 30% of your daily calories as high protein, mm -hmm. um, and showed that the high protein diet actually performed better in terms of uh, blood sugar control, what they deemed to be, which is kind of the primary uh, or the largest, uh, has the largest hazard ratio in terms of uh, contributing to uh, cardiovascular disease and, and just all-cause mortality in general. If you were to put a list together of, of, and put it in order of a hierarchy of, of worst uh, to least worst, your LDL markers are way down here at about a 1.4 up to maybe 3 in terms of the hazard ratio. Your uh, type 2 diabetes, you're looking at 10 to 15 in terms of hazard ratios, in terms of the likelihood, the, the percentage of people who will have uh, some sort of uh, cardiovascular disease or, or metabolic issue. And then you're, you know, you're talking obesity, high blood pressure, uh, you know, as you go down the list. Uh, but that's the big one is blood sugar. So 30% uh, protein in your diet has an extraordinary effect on mitigating uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, and then I talk about post-meal, doing the 10-minute walks, twice as effective as metformin for controlling postprandial glycemia, again, uh, a type 2 diabetes uh, uh, reversal or prevention marker. Uh, and metformin is the number one prescribed medication in the world for type 2 diabetes, which we just saw a recent study come out that showed that uh, long-term uh, mortality uh, benefits were no different uh, using metformin. That was the presumption because it, it, it has some benefit in terms yeah. of... Yeah, their studies are all over the place, so their studies yeah, coming out there's a lot. it increases longevity, so it's just... Yeah. It's a weird one. It's a weird one. Uh, and but it's, it's still, if you don't need it... That's the goal. Yeah, if, you, if you're using it for, for uh, longevity, uh, there is, as a bodybuilder, there's plenty of evidence, evidence to suggest that it impairs hypertrophy outcomes. Yes. Uh, sometimes people think, like I just had somebody recently ask me about anti-inflammatories. I think they were talking about uh, uh, curcumin or turmeric. Uh, the, the studies on that aren't conclusive, and there, there, there's not uh, a lot of evidence that it's even necessary if you don't have inflammation. Again, that's why we do the blood test. If you don't have mm -hmm. an elevated homocysteine or C-reactive protein, why are you taking anti-inflammatories? And can they actually impair the acute inflammatory response that's necessary for hormesis for you to actually recover from the workouts? It's before. another reason for the blood work. Another reason for the blood <laughs> yes, work. Is there's it, some things you don't need. Stan, what should I take? What are you deficient in? You know, what's yes. your current health status? So talk about sleep. Again, the primary is protein intake. Uh, the diet in general, I try and get a diverse range of proteins that are highly bioavailable and micronutrient dense, okay? And by that, I mean something uh, that historically would be eliminated by the guru diet or the, you know, your typical nutritionist diet for the bodybuilding figure, physique, bikini, wellness, you know, mankini. The, those diets are so unbelievably restrictive, and I've been dealing with this since the late 80s and trying to talk out about it. Uh, because I saw how much damage they did, both to me personally trying to over-restrictively diet or, or even on the other end of the spectrum to, uh, to uh, uh, dirty bulk, mm -hmm, you know, a gallon mm -hmm, of milk a day and mm -hmm. the cheese pizzas and the ice cream. Uh, I experienced metabolic syndrome. And on the other end, I experienced a significant amount of, uh, of muscle loss preparing for powerlifting. I've gained and lost over the course of, of my competitive career, well over a thousand pounds, albeit intentionally to, mm -hmm. to meet my goals at the time. But I experienced all these problems and just from happenstance or from trial and error, uh, I've come across what, you know, we said today that, that we're not gurus, we didn't invent this, but what Vince Garanda was talking about in the 60s, you know, steak and eggs, there's mm -hmm. a reason for that. And he was also talking about getting iodine, I think he was using a, a sea kelp, uh, sea kelp. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I recommend for compliance, uh, either iodized salt or 
cranberry juice because you sweat out iodine and it's important for thyroid function. But those over-restrictive diets would be, uh, they always, t and this happens today. You go to a nutritionist about your bodybuilding prep and they're like, okay, eliminate red meat, eliminate dairy, eliminate fruit, eliminate salt. I mean, it's right out of the gate. And, and the diets look the same. It's egg whites, tilapia, some boneless, skinless chicken breast, and all the broccoli you can possibly stuff in your mouth for fiber and, and what have you. That's incredibly uh, restrictive. And what we see is, particularly in women, because they eat fewer calories than men, we see the female triad. We see, uh, we see chronic calorie restriction resulting in, in anemia. We see, um, uh, we see low calcium as a part of that. Uh, and we see uh, amenorrhea, a cessation of the menstrual period. So these are three things that we commonly see. And I saw it in athletes at the University of Oregon. Way back in the early 90s, I was training runners, uh, both sprinters and distance runners. And the women in particular, and I think this came up recently at the, in Nike, they are actually sanctioned that they couldn't give diets to their athletes because up at Nike, they had a female runner, I, I think uh, uh, just within the last couple of years, came out and said that because of the chronic dieting, she ended up uh, suffering from the female triad yeah. and, and had uh, osteoporosis as a result. Uh, her menstrual period stopped, obviously. Uh, she started having shin splints. And I, I saw that in the early 90s. I thought the women would, would actually wear braces and go out and run mm -hmm. on their shins to do that. So I started seeing this in the bodybuilding industry, physique figure, bikini, et cetera. Uh, the, one of the, the more uh, prominent or prevalent uh, sim symptoms of this restrictive diet the egg whites lack biotin, the avid and robs biotin from the body because you're not eating the yolk. And so now you're, that's for your skin, hair, and nails. The chronic restriction, of course, has a massive effect on the thyroid. And so now that dry skin, hair, and nails starts falling out. You get these women with patches of hair falling out as they prep for competitions. Uh, the anemia, avoid red meat. Well, where do you think the iron is? And you've got a woman who's menstruating, eating egg whites and tilapia and, and whey shakes. Uh, which, as an aside, has anybody ever been backstage at a, at a bodybuilding <laughs> bikini show? The stink mm -hmm. back there is horrendous. Can you imagine? Egg whites, protein powders, and broccoli. Can you imagine what that smells like back there? It's unnecessary. It's over-restrictive. It's caused a host of, of uh, uh, you know, acute and chronic conditions that even after the show, they end up uh, at the hospital or the doctor's office getting shots for, you know, iron and B12 and, uh, uh, and antidepressants, for that matter, um, suffering from massive edema to the point where it's quite dangerous. The swelling of the ankles and the water retention, uh, an extraordinary amount of immediate fat regain uh, it happens much faster than the muscle uh, rebounds. Uh, so they, they, they end up actually with a worse metabolism than prior to starting diet, heavier with a slower basal metabolic rate. Uh, so I've seen this happen chronically since as far back as the late 80s and early 90s. And so uh, the vertical diet was intended to, to say, look, this is a better pathway. Include red meat, include whole eggs for these micronutrients. That's your body needs. You'll perform better. You'll stay stronger longer. You'll feel better uh, and not you know, accumulate these chronic conditions, uh, hopefully at all and not have the rebound from, from competition. And I, I prepared Nadia Wyatt for the Miss Olympia two years in a row. She took third place. She was completely shredded. She ate steak and fruit and potatoes every single day, sent me a picture of every meal, was still squatting two and a quarter for reps right up to a week before the show, which she loves to do. Nadia, she loves to lift heavy weights. Her cardio preparing for that show was three 10 minute walks a day after meals. That was it. She didn't put two hours in on the treadmill mm -hmm. and she was shredded. She was the hardest woman on stage. You acquire that mostly through diet, but you retain your lean body mass through resistance training, as we talked about earlier, not lightening the weights and increasing mm -hmm. the reps, but maintaining a really intense, heavy, and that doesn't mean you can't do 10, 12 repetitions, but it's still heavy. Mm -hmm. heavy. As your strength declines in the gym, you have to assume that your muscle mass is also declining. And so that should be one of your primary goals, particularly for that industry. Uh, and so she did two a day weight training instead of doing uh, all that excessive cardio. So I touched on a lot of stuff that's probably the top five or six things mm -hmm. that, that I recommend in the diet uh, when, I, when I get a client. What I would throw back out there, just out of curiosity's sake, is 
<clears throat> assuming that they're not supplementing anything, and I'm sure that they are, just regular supplements. Yeah. And with that restrictive diet, when you also see a deficiency in electrolytes and it because mm. they're pulling the salt. Yeah, that's why I keep no the potassium, salt and right? the potassium in there. Yeah, the as well and... as A, D, E, and K. Yeah, 100%. The fat's being pulled. Yeah, it's, you, know. you shouldn't get your fats. That's why I like like a top sirloin steak. It's yeah. still got... No, I'm talking the tilapia, the rice, right. the, the old And the egg stuff. yolk. Yes. You, here's what the the the, the, uh, the gurus will tell you, is that eat egg whites, but throw a dollop of, of peanut butter in there for your <laughs> fat. Exactly. That doesn't replace an egg yolk. Yes. It, it, not only is it not a good protein source, deficient in leucine, not a complete protein, uh, polyunsaturated fats, but it doesn't have the biotin and the choline and all the other micronutrients that are in the whole egg. But you're right. I, I do initially, I'll bring fat down like I might start with a New York steak and then you know a month later I might go to a top sirloin then a month later I might get to a, a sirloin tip or a top round or a grass-fed steak uh, to bring the fats down but I don't like to see them below 20% of total calories it's unnecessary that's the point at which I might start reducing carbohydrates I love to keep carbs in for performance as to fuel those anaerobic workouts I prefer to keep the 50% carbs in and I'll only start to bring them down that last month or so as necessary uh, just to get that last few pounds of body fat off. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. thinking more of D has become more and more prevalent, especially since this thing that we've yep. been living through the last 100%. couple of years, it's this yeah. coming through the roof where in my mind process, and I'm no expert in this. If you're supplementing D, but you have no fat in your diet, yeah. it's not going to do a whole hell of a lot. That's true of ADE and K all, you're just all together. Throw, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're just throwing it away yeah. to where, the reason I bring this up is I had a friend of mine that was supplement was on a super low fat diet yeah. and it wouldn't go up. And I'm like, if you keep doing it, take a tablespoon of peanut butter when you take the D, right. You know, you need some fats to be able to get there. hundred percent. And it went straight up and he's like, holy shit. I'm like, what am I, what am I talking about? Just, you see what I'm saying? It's, yep. You can't just pull a macronutrient. No. completely out of your diet and assume that there's not going to be any ramifications. Yeah. Same is true of, uh, of omega-3s. I do salmon twice a week, about five ounce serving. That's sufficient to get uh, the, the, the amount of omega-3 that, that uh, I think most research has suggested yeah, yeah. Is, is healthy. And some people will talk about eating, say, a grass-finished steak instead of a grain-finished steak to get more omega-3s. It's, it's not a meaningful dose. Salmon has 200 times the omega-3s as steak, whether it's grass or grain-fed. It's just pixie dusting at that point. It's yeah. not meaningful. It doesn't provide you any, any benefit. Same thing would be true of, say, a, a pink salt. People talk about all the minerals in there. They're not of significant enough quantity to give you any meaningful benefit, and it's absent iodine. So if it tastes great for you, eat it, but you're going to need an iodine source, and don't count on that for things like uh, magnesium and your other micronutrients that you're going to want to get. Uh, magnesium is another one hard to get from food. I usually supplement that. Yeah, one, so. yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that you can, just, I don't know if it's as prevalent as it used to be. There used to be people that would think that in order to be healthy, you can't be at peak performance, right? Performance and health are kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, right? What's, this kind of spits in the face of that just a little bit. A little bit. I, I mean, it's not as restrictive. And I mentioned, I did the video, if you want to be healthy, don't compete. Yeah. Okay. And I said there's a difference between fitness and health. Mm -hmm. The fitness level required to be a world's strongest man. Probably not healthy. Mm -mm. To be a UFC champion, probably not healthy. None of it is. To be a 14-year-old gymnast in the Olympics, tearing Achilles tendons and having mm -hmm. carpal tunnel syndrome uh, uh, surgically repaired. To be a 10-year-old badminton player in China, blowing out their collateral lag lateral ligament <laughs> from repetitive strain. Uh, none of those things are healthy, but it's the fitness level required to achieve that goal. And I mentioned earlier that, that we make certain sacrifices with, for, for this uh, to achieve our goals. I think what was the, uh, the, I don't know if it was a study, but somebody talked about questioning Olympic athletes if they wanted to get a gold medal mm -hmm. and be willing to take a, a particular drug that would cause some significant health issues or maybe even cause them to die in five years. Mm -hmm. A lot of them would take it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's their only goal. So I really try and mitigate damage. Mm -hmm. I don't expect, you, you know, to be able to solve the problem of, of the, the fitness required to, to be a champion. I think I listened to a video last night about one of the most uh, prominent um, uh, uh, conditioning coaches for Tour de France athletes and said now that the drug testing is, is uh, the way it is, it's so much more comprehensive uh, that none of these guys could compete with the guys from the 90s and 2000s, the, the Lance Armstrong group and prior. Uh, they just couldn't tell the EPO those guys were having and their, mm -hmm. their blood 
thickness in the 60s, having to get up in the middle of the night to drink water so that Mm -hmm. their blood doesn't turn into gel. Uh, You know, and those are some of the things I'm talking Mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. respect to getting a blood test and looking at your RBCs and hemoglobin and hematocrit. That's what's killing some of these big athletes between blood pressure and thick blood. And there's interventions that you can implement first having knowledge of the fact that it exists. That's the biggest one. And with the blood test and just getting a blood pressure cuff and then having an action plan, which I provide in the Mm -hmm. book, for high blood pressure, high blood sugar, quick fix kit uh, for controlling lipids, thick blood, whether it's donating, uh, you know, whatever you need to do to mitigate that damage. So it, it, it's not healthy to compete. Uh, you mentioned performance enhancing drugs. I was talking mm-hmm. about women. This is one of the reasons why uh, I've been so vocal as of late, because back when these uh, bikini girls or bodybuilders back then were competing in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, they were using a lot of the same things they're using today. They'll use Anivar to prevent the, mm. the sarcopenia, the muscle tissue loss. Uh, they'll use thyroid to uh, mitigate the obvious hypothyroidism that was causing mm-hmm. the hair mm-hmm. loss. They'll take uh, clombuterol or uh, any other central nervous system stimulator to increase their metabolism, which is obviously slowed from mm-hmm. uh, all the stuff. The soccer moms aren't using that arsenal of things. And so they are losing the muscle and they are losing the mm-hmm. hair and they aren't getting the same results. Uh, and and th- they aren't aware that that's what's going on behind the scenes, and so they're they're suffering from all the downsides without any of the you know the arsenal that, that helps them uh, to achieve what they think is you know the optimal uh, physique that they're mm-hmm. that they're achieving. So that's kind of who I'm talking to here. Less so the people in the fitness industry, although that's exploded to the point now. There's more people participating uh, in in bodybuilding, figure physique, bikini, wellness. Uh, than there ever has been in the past, but it's the general population has now seen them on social media and is trying to emulate their diet and training programs without understanding the downsides and the medical interventions that they're utilizing to achieve yeah. those. I think the conversation is still good for those that are competing because yes, it's mitigating, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you've come out the other end, I've come out the other end. So we both know people mm-hmm. that have come out the other end. Some do very well. Some never train again. Some just get super fat as fuck. Some, but I wonder, had they been exposed to the health implications they were sacrificing beforehand, then when they leave, you know, in the first couple years after they, when they really leave, I mean, Mm -hmm. everybody leaves, but doesn't really know they've left, you know, for a while. When they get there, then they're going to know where to look. You know, they're going to say, okay, look, there's the damage that was potentially created here. These are the scans I need. The, so, because a lot of the the ones that come out the other end that just don't quit, right? They're, they're not still competing, but they're still PEDs. They're still not at the same dose. So, well, some, I mean, we know the idiots, right? Yeah. But most, they just, re- they just lower everything. Right. Right. So, they downsize, whatever you want to call it. That downsizing is still coming with most of them that I've known with the same risk as when they were still competing. Yeah. Because they never learned how to mitigate it. Yeah. And now when they're they're older. Yeah, so they're older, right? So now it's easier in a way for them to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. They just don't know how. Yeah. Because they, you you get what I'm saying? 100%, that's why Matt had talked about his employees competing and getting injured and Mm -hmm. recovering from that uh, as like I said, I learned strictly from trial and error. I did a lot of dumb things. I dieted mm-hmm. for shows on egg whites and tilapia and, and, and two hours of cardio today. Mm-hmm. I did that. Uh, I dirty bulked. I saw what uh, it did to my blood markers and metabolic syndrome and high blood pressure and blood sugars and kidney liver enzymes. I, I saw all that. It yeah. scared me. Mm-hmm. And so I said, you know, I need to do something different here. And hence all of the things we just discussed that I do did for myself and do for my clients. It's like, that's a problem. You know, we can't ignore that. Yes. But, like we said, if you don't know or you aren't willing yes. to at least uh, admit to yourself uh, and identify it through some testing. Well, age changes things too. I it, mean, when you're 20, you can just... blast everything and your blood markers yeah. are just, not everybody, but your blood markers like, <laughs> fuck yeah. You're like, what the hell, dude? You're taking 10 grams of shit. Yeah. And, no, it's all good. Like in your 30s, it changes. In your 40s, it changes. Then it starts changing. And some of these guys women as well, Mm. you know, be in their fifties and be like, well, man, when I was 20, I was taking five grams of test, man. I I need to load it up. (laughs) (laughs) Now that don't work like that. 
That's yeah. hard. We, <laughs> we talked about the way I train now as opposed to the way I used to train. And it, it's, it's more, it's also the same outside the gym. It's the same with uh, what you know you refer to to these days as HRT or HRT mm-hmm. plus. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Depending on whether it's summer or what have you. But recovery is big, man. I mean, the older you get, the more important recovery comes. When you're in your 20s, you can go out and drink and go in and hit max effort squats. be no big deal. 100%. You know, and. And eat McDonald's when you're in your 20s. Exactly. exactly. You get away with a lot. And then you try to carry it over into your third. That's why I think the longer somebody does it with the experience, those are the people I want to listen to because they got away with a lot of stuff in their 20s. In the 30s, they still kind of got away with it. In their 40s, they realized, oh, shit, you know, I need to get to bed. I need to quit this drinking shit. (laughs) You know, I got to really, really focus on the recovery. And then they can, would that benefit the 20-year-old? Be honest, I don't know. I, I really, because they're going to recover anyhow. Is it going to make them recover better? Who, who knows? What, what, right. Is there over optimal recovery? I don't know. Right. But I don't think that's really who we're talking about. But I think even that 20 year old here in the conversation, if they keep doing it and they get to their 30s, then when they start thinking, you know what, maybe I'm done. Maybe you're not done. Maybe now you need to start looking yeah. at the sleep and the recovery. And I get it. The 20 year old me wouldn't listen to the 54 I, I, I year old me, you know? And so I could say it till I'm blue in the face. If I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done I, it. I wouldn't have made so many. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. I certainly don't want my, my son to bodybuild or powerlift, but uh, so you're going to be smart. You're going to do things with your brain. Uh, but I would have, I think I would have been better sooner. Yes, because I learned most of my lessons. Had uh, you listen and had to come back yes. when I was, uh, you know, thirty eight through nine forty in, in early forties. Yeah. With the, the story I like to tell about this is, I, I distinctly remember having breakfast with people when I'm in my twenties at yeah. powerlifting meet or whatever, and there's the forty year old fucking dude that, yeah. you know, it's giving me the advice, <laughs> eating at fucking eggs and shit. I'm like, just shut up. Dude, yeah. you don't know that I'm gonna fucking kick your ass. You suck on right. the beach. You know, they're they're trying to help, man. But it's, right. I realize now I'm that dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh fuck! Now that I'm that dude, I know what I was thinking. Yeah. So I know what they're thinking. How can I do this better? Yeah. You know how? Yeah. <laughs> I, I I try and like I've worked with Larry Wheels when he was mm-hmm. 19, 20, 21. You know, I flew him out to Vegas and he lived out there for months and got a chance to work with him. Uh, probably part of the reason you asked me initially what, what are Stan's goals. I'm talking about staying jacked for my, my daughter to get through college or high school, not college. She's on her own in college. <laughs> but uh, uh, part of it is, is nobody would fucking listen to me if I was just sitting in front of my swimming pool eating bonbons talking about what I used to do and wearing my T-shirt that says Google me, bitch. Right? <laughs> I, I have to maintain at least some respectable level uh, mm-hmm. and and do it without limping around all the time mm-hmm. so that uh, so that I can at least get some uh, get them to listen mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's important and a lot of uh, of really smart folks PhDs Lane Norton said the same thing nobody listens to him he doesn't have a six pack they call him fat mm-hmm. uh, Pat Davidson extraordinary uh, mind uh, PhD in exercise phys I just went down to Miami for his seminar a few weeks ago. He said the same thing. Yeah, he had to lose weight and get a six pack so people would just listen to him. Mm-hmm. Dude's smart as hell. He's got a PhD. Mm-hmm. You know, he knows what he's talking about, but nobody listened to him because he was chubby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so I, I'm I'm stuck in the same thing. I'd I'd like to uh, put my feet up for a little while and mm-hmm. you know not train as hard maybe every now and then. Although I got to say I, I had kind of sort of done that a little bit, and then it was, I don't know it was five six years ago I went down to Venice and I trained with Mike O'Hearn. And he kicked my ass all over the gym. It was embarrassing. And I went home and realized that, uh, that I'm, I wasn't done yet. I got to keep, I got to hang in there. So yeah. uh, some things can be motivating. Some things can be discouraging, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring your ego back up just a little bit because you're feeling bad because <laughs> Michael Hearn busted your ass. When I was talking to Mark last night, I'm like, give me a story that I can throw out to Stan. Yeah. <clears throat> that he's like, well, we were squatting together one time. And it was a safety bar box squat workout. Oh, Mark yeah. was about 320. Yeah. You're about 270. And you're kicking his ass all the time. Yeah. And he's like, he he got this feeling because your warm-up says it didn't look too good. Like, today's the day. I'm going to be able to get him. You yeah. know, so. And Mark's telling me, he's like, man, I was putting my briefs on. He said, I would put my suit on. Yeah, you had power lifting briefs. I was going to do, I was going <laughs> to do, what, I was gonna do whatever yeah. I had to do. But I was going to get his ass. And we kept working up. And so what? the way... 
Yeah. He, he threw bands on. And I, oh, yeah, there's bands. Never I used bands in, in a box. Yeah, like I had said. never used bands yeah. before. Yeah, so he said, what I had him do is I had Throwing him do. all over the place. Yeah, he <laughs> said, I had him do the safety squat bar, which he'd never done before. Right. I had him box squat, which he'd never done before. <laughs> I had him do bands, which he's never done before. I was 320, yeah. which was good for me. Wearing canvas and, uh, briefs. I was wearing <laughs> briefs. So I, I, he said, I set the stage so there was no way I could lose. And then you're working up, and I think yeah. the weight was like 495 or And I was all over the place. The thing it was, was whipping everywhere. me around yeah. everywhere. I just stand up with it, and I was all over the place. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he just looked terrible that he did this one, and we came up oh. really slow. Then Mark said then he did one. He's like, okay, this is good. And then you got underneath there. You took a little extra time yeah. getting set up under the bar. Changed his feet just a little bit. Sat down, and they just <laughs> come up like this. And then you looked at Mark, and you said, I figured it out now. I think I got and it. Mark just said, <laughs> I, I was deflated. He said he smacked my ass the rest of the day. Because you didn't know what to do. No. You didn't know where the bands were to stand, where no. to put the bar. No. And all oh, I was cracking up. That's a I, neat thing about bodybuilding. You do so many different, <laughs> such a variety of exercises from such a number of different angles that you, you, know, it, it, you learn pretty quick. It was a good, <laughs> easy learning curve. But I, I'll tell you, on the opposite end of that, I've never used uh, uh, suits so I put on a bench shirt and didn't get anything out of it. I put on a, a single ply squat suit. I didn't get anything out of it. So, uh, you know, you, you got to live in, in those different worlds. Yeah. We, we talked about strength being specific, but all those leverages and things, you got to, you got to practice your, uh, your sport. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I want to see that. We need to get him in a suit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be some shit. Um, I think w- one of the, the overarching tenets of the episode today is, is obviously nutrition, sleep, like all the little things kind of, they don't add up, they multiply. And when it comes to performance, they, when it comes to being the best you can be in your sport and whatever it is. But also another thing I think we should harp in on a little bit is you're not saying don't train hard, right? You're not saying, you're saying the complete opposite of that. It's like, you need to set all the other things in motion so you can bust your ass in the gym. I mean, we have that, we have some footage of you hitting that hack squat and it's like, First and foremost, you can hit those fucking high notes <laughs> when it starts getting heavy. I've never been a quiet lifter. No, no, and it's very real. Like, yeah. and you can just, you know, you're you're getting after it. But yeah. you're lifting hard. Like you're training hard. It, it just because you're you, you're the vertical diet guy, and it's like, oh yeah, eat your your beef and rice and go for walks and shit. Like it's yeah. not. He's not saying like don't fucking bust your ass in the gym, yeah. right? You said it. Training. Yeah. We're not exercising. We're training. Yeah. Uh, Eddie Cohn said it in his book, The Man, The Myth, The Method. He said that you don't go to the gym. Uh, there's only one reason to go to the gym. It's to get better. Yeah. And, and somehow, some way, you know, we, and, and, and like I said with Matt's board, there's many different ways to set PRs at the gym, whether it's reps or sets or rest periods or weight. There's many different ways to progress. We always go into the gym with the idea yeah. of setting a PR. We design our whole workout around, and today we did a PR on that machine. And I asked you, too. I said, what, who lifted the most? We talked about earlier. And then you said that Juji did it. And I'm like, what did Juji get? Yeah. You know, <laughs> real competitive that way. When yeah. Juji came out to train with me, I took him out to the stairs to run stairs because I, I knew he hadn't probably done that. And I had, had had some practice, and there's there's timing that's involved in that, so you're not tripping mm-hmm. all over the place. And uh, he he got me like by an inch, <laughs> but he was shocked because I'm an old man. Juicy's a young yeah. athletic guy, and at the very top, he's like, you know. So it was it was fun, but uh, everything is a competition, yeah, and everything's yeah. about progression. And you know, even at my age, because people are like, oh, Stan, it's unhealthy, and you're gonna you know ruin your back like Ronnie Coleman. And I'm like, let me just say that Ronnie Coleman didn't hurt his back. Uh, lifting. Ronnie Coleman's fucked up because he got a bad advice from a terrible a surgeon. surgeon. I, I'm glad you said 100%. that. hundred percent. Yeah. Same thing happened to Flex Wheeler. He had mm-hmm. drop foot when a surgeon got in there and started fucking around with his back. I yeah. wish more people would look at the history of what actually happened. Yes, with all indeed. That. Uh, weightlifting is one of the least injurious uh, sporting choices I, I, you can make. I could be wrong, but didn't the mm-hmm. ca- the first cage that they put in him, didn't it only last like eight hours? Yeah, I'm not and then the sure. screws broke. I mean, it Anyhow, keep hey, going. Even even a PhD. And he kept fucking going. Back. Oh, sorry, he kept yeah. going back to the same guy. Yeah, that's the problem. So anyhow, anyhow, let's move on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Surgery. So yeah. Anyhow, uh, a lot of people ask me about that. And look, bone mineral density is is improved from weightlifting. Uh, joint stability, integrity, thickness, even of your uh, of your meniscus. Uh, all and your and your tendons and your ligaments all improve. It's it's a hormetic effect if properly programmed over time. 
it, your body's not degenerative, it's regenerative. And you just have to give it the right stimulus, uh, again, progressively over time. And uh, repetitive strain can be just as bad as overloading, you know, with a high, heavy single. And so you gotta be cautious about those things. I've certainly done it to myself, you know, both many times over my career, and just a little smarter now. Uh, but I'm not, you know, willing to suggest that you shouldn't go in and still train uh, to within, uh, you know, somewhere near your your current maximum capability, uh, because over time it's really the rate at which, as I age from my 50s and my 60s and my 70s, the guys I see in the gym in their 70s who are still lifting are standing straight up and down and have a firm handshake. The ones that I don't see training, that are sitting at home, accumulated a gut, they're all bent over and, and kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, decrepit at this point and walking sort of funny. Mm -hmm. uh, the rate at which you decline can be slowed. And that's kind of, you know, I, I hope I haven't crested that peak yet, <laughs> but uh, that is a concern of mine. Uh, I think Dr. Peter Atia probably most popularly talks a lot about that now is that, that He's looking at the centenarian Olympics and, and uh, how, for how many years can he put a bag in an overhead compartment and can he, uh, you know, get up and move and have stability and strength? Because we know that, that all-cause mortality is uh, directly linked to strength, handshake, grip strength. We talk about that. And, um, you know, we talk about uh, probably the leading indicator is your VO2 max. Mm -hmm. But your VO2 max is dependent upon your muscle mass because that's what draws the oxygen. And so really that's the foundation. If you ask me to choose between cardio and weightlifting, I, I, again, weightlifting is cardio and provides all of those other metabolic benefits. Well, bone density as well. Bone mineral density. T consuming calcium does not do a lot for bone mineral density. Consuming calcium and protein and sufficient magnesium is required, but also a loading component. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much protein and calcium you feed uh, an astronaut, they're going to have uh, osteoporosis, mm -hmm. they're going to have bone mineral des density loss uh, because they don't have any loading component. That's why they specifically send them up there with uh, bands or whatever apparatus they use to try and load. And even then, because it's inadequate stimulus, they realize a significant amount of bone, yeah. bone loss. Mm -hmm. And so those are all the things that I consider as I age and the reasons why people are like, oh, this isn't gonna end well, and you know, your knees, and you're gonna be Ronnie Coleman, and I'm just like, you know, you do you, I'll mm -hmm. do me. I think I have a better plan in place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting about Stan, I say, uh, we talk about authenticity. I remember one time, uh, one thing I like about, one thing I like about Louie is he's always authentic. Like when he tells people, drag a sled or he drags a sled three times a week or does mm -hmm. reverse hypers before and after he works. He does, right? Mm -hmm. so, so whether you agree with how Louis trains or not, mm -hmm. he's authentic. He's not telling you to do something he would never do. I basically lived with Stan last eight months. I'm telling you, he walks after every meal. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't deviate from his diet. It's, it's, it's not a sales pitch. It's really real. He's as authentic as anybody I've ever met. Yep. And it works. And, it, and I think like you said earlier, I always say this, the test of time is the most, you know, you can be a flash in the pan, that could be your genetics, mm -hmm. but you can't sell me your genetics, mm -hmm. but you can sell longevity. Yes. Yeah. You know, I had dinner with my wife the other night, and I just I just leaned back, we were just kind of having a, a candid conversation. I said, look, I'm not tired, I'm yeah. not bored, I'm not done. I'm not gonna power lift any more competitively, but I just feel like the, the world is still my oyster. There's so many more opportunities. After everything that I've done thus far in my life, mm -hmm. and, and those people who've, who've, who know my career, uh, both inside the gym and outside the gym, uh, financially and business and, and everything else, you know, now having kids and, and looking forward, I, I'm just, there's so many more chapters to be written and I feel uh, as though I could do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't feel tired or old or, or, or anything at 54 any more so than I did at 30. So mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the, the most important thing about having these, these habits, like Matt said, the, the little 10 minute walks and the paying attention to getting sufficient sleep and uh, consistently eating, you know, I hate to use the word healthy and I hate having these good food, bad food conversations, but just, you know, maintaining good blood markers like we discussed today, and blood pressure and, and, and lipids and blood sugars. All of those things are kind of the foundation for anything I want to do, not just a great squat day. That's the most exciting thing to me at, at this yeah. moment in my life, uh, but I'm able to do anything I want. And so, you know, I think that's probably the most rewarding part of 
uh, working with people now and sending the message that I send is because a lot of folks get pretty tired in their late 40s and early mm -hmm. 50s and and they're kind of looking for answers and uh, a lot of times people are trying to give them quick fixes or you know a pill or potion or powder and it's like no it's it's uh, it's never any one thing it's a combination of, of things it's a, you know the whole being greater than the sum of its parts and, uh, and it's consistently and the consistency component the important thing about it and I've always said compliance is the science is that it has to be simple, sensible, and sustainable. It can't be, I gotta go to the gym and do an hour and a half of, of treadmill or something like that, because who's got time for that? You know, the barriers to entry are too high. The, the, the enjoyability, the, the, you know, the likelihood that you do that for any period of time are, are pretty slim. And so I try and design things that fit within somebody's existing schedule uh, and that they enjoy. Because once your, your brain considers this to be uh, something unenjoyable, the likelihood that you're going to do it for an extended period of time goes way down. Willpower is not a good method to accomplish anything. You, you, no. you got to find it's a like, way. That's like motivation. It comes and goes. Yeah. I mean, what are the big reasons, if I can remember, what are the big reasons why people don't accomplish things? Uh, uh, probably number one, procrastination is probably the biggest reason. Uh, another one would be uh, fear of rejection uh, would be a big one. Uh, and it's something I call three minute motivation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Which, every it seems like every day now more than ever. You, you know, Joe Rogan speech, mm -hmm. or, you know, you name the motivational person, and they're like, yeah, yeah, and you're like, yeah, yeah, rah, rah. Mm -hmm. It's bumper sticker to bumper sticker to you know to motivational speech, but it's one percent inspiration and ninety nine percent perspiration, mm -hmm. and I think people get addicted to motivation after a while, and they love looking at the videos. Uh, but what's your action plan? You know, mm -hmm. a goal without a plan is just a dream. And so what's your action plan? Did you break that down into steps that you can that you can consistently achieve? And you have to start you have to enjoy the process because like we mentioned earlier there's there's no finish line. It's not like once I get there I'm done. It, it, you have to enjoy the journey otherwise there's there's no way you're going to you're going to stick yeah. with it for the long term. Well, it's yeah. a good it's a good uh, lesson even in building your career because Jones John reaches out to Stan on a phone call. So what would most people do? I'll send you a diet or I'll send you my... Mm -hmm. Stan says, when are you training next? And John's like, I think we train Thursday. Stan's like, all right, I'm on, I'm on my way. I'll be there Thursday. Stan shows up with meals. He's ready. He didn't... He took action. Yeah. Had Nobody a asked you to go. I was all over his ass. I'm like, I'm like, come on, John, let's go. Let's go. Two minutes. Let's go. Let's go. What mm -hmm. are you sitting down? There's no seats in the in the in the octagon. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what started the whole thing moving, is that uh, people want to be led they want to be helped and i think too with the uh, motivated you know the problem now with social media is great for some things but you know, i sound like old but in our day or in the old days you, you had to earn your platform mm -hmm. so like if you wanted to have a voice you had to do something like if you wanted a poster on your wall be a pro athlete mm -hmm. you want, mm -hmm. now everybody's got the platform without the work and everybody loves to be, you know, it's like yeah, sometimes life's tough and you got to persevere. It's like, why don't you get out of your parents' basement? Yeah. <laughs> like, stop posting. I don't want to get my advice yeah, from Yeah, what you. have you overcome? Help me understand it. Yeah. I got a degree in psychology at the University of Oregon, and I went to my counselor and my professor, and I said, look, I want to get an MSW, a master's in social work. I want to help people with drug addiction. My mom was an addict all my life. I've talked about the story before as an alcoholic growing up, and addicted to painkillers and ultimately psychiatric medications that landed her in and out of uh, mental institutions for the uh, later years of her life and, and ultimately died of an overdose of fentanyl of all things in her 70s. So, but even from that young age in college, I kind of wanted to help based on my mom's experience. And uh, she said, Stan, have you ever been addicted to anything? End of conversation. She's like, is there something else you'd like to do? I said, yeah, I'd love to lift weights. And she goes, go to the exercise science program. So I spent two more years you know, dissecting cadavers and anatomy and mm -hmm. and kinese and chemistry and all that stuff. Uh, and that's how I, I, I made my career. Again, early in my life, difficult to do. Had to find a number of other ways to, to make money. But, uh, you know, now I'm in doing something that I love. But, uh, you know, that's important. You, you absolutely have to, you know, do something that you, you love to be effective at it. The other thing, too, is, you know, like, um, I think in my career, and it's not some great career, but I never did, I always just, I want to say this. Like I met Louis Simmons with Joe Collins. Remember Joe? Hmm. So Joe says, "We're going to. I'm going to go meet Louis Simmons. Do you want to go?" I never met Louis. You know, Louis's up there. Like, you know, he's put you on ten thousand exercises. Says, "I'll help you." He's like, "Why don't you start coming up?" So I did. 
But I didn't have an expectation. I just wanted to get better. And that's how I met Buddy Morris when Buddy's at Pittsburgh. He's going through GA positions. He's like, look at all these GA applications. Nobody talks about Louis Simmons. Joe Collins is there. He yeah. says, I know a guy. He'll leave right now. He trains with Louis Simmons. You can't wait for the opportunity to get ready. You have to be working towards it. Mm-hmm. Like, so when, when I met, when Stan had me come out to meet John, the first day he goes, you love this shit, don't you? He's like, you're nuts. But I do. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't, you couldn't fly me out and say, hey, do you want to train John Jones? And it's like, oh, let me get serious about lifting real quick. It's like, it's too late. Right. So you're making your opportunities. I always come back to authenticity. You know, no one ever had to tell you to lift. Mm-hmm. Like, you were serious. When you come from Toledo to lift oh, yeah. with Louie, and then you lift mm-hmm. in the dungeons and mm-hmm. get a job based around you know, the West side. That's all I ever wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So for you to have all this, it Mm -hmm. wasn't like somebody said, Hey Dave, we'll give you this great business. Get into lifting. You're like, Oh, I'll do it. No, it's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, my entire life, people were telling me not to do this. Right. Yeah. You know, to do everything else. I mean, even when I was younger training for wrestling, like, Hey, you don't want to do that. You need to do this. I'm like, I like to do this. If I'm stronger than everybody else. I got to be better than everybody else. You know, and then just, I don't, don't rehash my whole life story, but even going into college, it's like, you know, I want to do it. No, you don't want to do that. You can't make money doing that. You find something else. And college professors, even taking the exercise science stuff, it was, you got to do something else. You got to do something else. My whole life I've been told yeah. to do the complete opposite of what I've done my whole entire fucking life. Yeah. It, it's, so it's, yeah. to the contrary to all them, fuck off. You know, it's, you know, I, I, I work that way. You know, I, I work in resistance, I suppose, where you know, tell me to do something, I'm going to tell you to fuck off, I'm going to find another way. That's right. You know, especially if there's no credibility. Isn't that what powerlifting is well, all about? But what's funny yeah, is, yeah, like, yeah. think of all the coaches that come here and ask you for advice. Mm-hmm. You can't say, like, hey, the strength coach from Clemson wants to come out. Well, hold on, let me get let me get into strength training. It's, it's too late. No, 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 it's too late. No, and, that's too late. And it was, yeah. it's so they mm-hmm. do it, you were going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody was like, do you still lift? Because I don't post my, I don't lift. I'm like, I lift mm-hmm. every day, but mm-hmm. it's just, I don't post, I never posted it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was never, it, it was never about that for me. I just really wanted to get stronger and get better and mm-hmm. see if I could get help. You know, I got the overspeed treadmill. He thought it was nuts. I said, we're going to buy, I had to have it made. It's like a $30,000 treadmill. Mm-hmm. Guy's like, Jason's going, what are you doing? I said, I think it'll work. Yeah. We shipped one out to Albuquerque and put John in mm-hmm. it within shit, four weeks. I mean, he went from 18 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour on that thing, and his coaches at the gym were like, what the hell are you doing? He's up under people like and rocket, takedowns. Yeah. It's like a rocket. They couldn't sprawl mm-hmm. on him. It was crazy. Yeah. yeah. But I, did, I never did it really with a money purpose. I just said, this can get you guys faster. Yeah. You knew mm-hmm. it worked. And that's because you tried it first. You yeah, came, came back and you were <laughs> kicking everybody's ass on the track. That's right. Years ago, yeah, yeah. as a kid. And yeah. we know it works. I mean, the research shows that it mm-hmm. works. Matt Davidson talks highly about it. Dr. Andy Galpin, you know, overspeed training is extremely effective. It's just kind of hard to find a way to do it because either you're dragging people, which now you still have eccentric loading from decelerating, but that machine provides us almost all concentric sprinting with hips forward. Uh, and you can adjust the height. It's less, again, stimulus yeah. fatigue ratio. Uh, it's been fantastic. And it's kind of a little off topic, but coming full circle, you know, all these trainers, I see this now, like Dave said, you know, like three spots left. Or Stan and I see all these ads. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like, be an online trainer. I make a hundred grand a year and he's on a golf course or a boat. And remember the one guy had like mm-hmm. all these pictures. He's Ferrari. like, yeah. And, it's, and I always say to people when they say, well, I want to do online, I say, that's great. And I tell this to my, you know, my trainers heard this last week. I say, you're special, but not for why you think you're special. Yeah. Because if you want to go online, now you can comp- maybe you compete against Josh Bryant or Stan. You don't know more than Stan. Mm-hmm. So it's not your magic program. It's that they can see you three, four days a week. Yeah. You can talk to them. It's that you have more influence that way. But everybody kind of wants to skip the step. I bet everybody would love to be Dave Tate right now. Uh, come in, not. come in on a leap. <laughs> I mean, this warehouse is paradise, right? Everybody yeah. knows who you are. You have your own podcast. Hmm. They don't want to do what you did and what nobody talks about. Like with our gyms, there was no proof of concept. Like our gym is unique. Now there's a lot of them. When I started out, I just was like, I need to make money and I don't want to leave the fitness industry. Yeah. I, w- I want to be able to train. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a couple, couple things that came to mind as you were speaking there is, the 
say everybody wants to be me or say they want to be Stan, there's, I, I get it, right? I get where that's coming from, but some of that kind of comes back on whoever is that person, Stan, myself, other people, to share the adversities that came with it. Sure. Because what people see most of the time is, look, 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 here's this fantasy. It's like, yeah. do you have any idea how many fucking times I've been sued? You know, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot that doesn't get discussed, right? For sure. Because it's not good marketing to discuss that may be good authenticity, but if that's all you talk about, well then you're just the angry asshole that I can be sometimes. Yeah. That you just end up being, but that gets lost. So what people see when they're aspiring to be this person is the 10, 20% that looks good. Right. They're not seeing the 80%, call it grind, call it adversity, call it, I call it the process of just what it is. We've just assumed this comes, to, you have to do this to get the 20%. Yeah. yeah. But this that nobody ever sees is the real work, right? So right. when I hear people say things like, as you said a little bit earlier, you got to really love what you do, you know, my mind goes, uh, this, but I don't love this other 80%. Yeah. I don't, I don't. That's just the grind shit that I have to do that I'm unmotivated to do, but I still have to do it. It has to be done where people become incense or become desensitized to the work it actually takes to get that 20%. Same thing with training, right? Everybody wants to see the max effort lift, the last lift, the yeah. screaming lift, the right. grind set. Yeah. You know, they don't want to see the 965,000 reps that just were boring as all fuck that you didn't even want to do. Yeah. You know, I'm saying like you go in the gym, you, you really want to do your warm up? No, right. you're doing that so you can do that last set balls to the wall. You, yeah. you get what I'm 100%, saying? 100%. So that's kind of that part unpacked. The other part with social media and the internet, it's kind of twofold. And you'll remember, you're not as old as what we are, but you're still kind of old. <laughs> Um, many, many years ago with, I'll use pro bodybuilders because it's easier for people to relate to. You had Flex Magazine, Muscular mm -hmm. Development, uh, Muscle and Fitness, a couple other ones. You would read these articles or flip through the magazines and you, at the time, you would think, holy crap, Jay Cutler is a fucking multimillionaire. Because the magazine was telling the story. The magazine yeah. was telling the narrative. The magazine controlled who is Jay. Who is Ronnie? Who is Branch? And then when you would meet these people, you'd find out, not saying that this was Jay, but you're gonna find out, man, they're living in a $300 apartment, they're broke as fuck, they're living off their girlfriend. This isn't who they are because the magazine created who they were. Same yeah. with Sports Illustrated and NFL players and all this other stuff as well. Those people on your walls when we were growing up, that's not, they were not really who we thought they were, yeah. right? Now, you know. Yeah, that's a good but point. It, it, what it also does, though, is that now the magazines, the, the news networks, they can't cherry pick their favorites anymore. Because if they do, right, they can't tell the narrative. They can try to tell the narrative, but then you gotta tell those players, don't post on social media. Right. Don't say anything to anybody. Here, you got to go through our HR department and PR department before you even give a press interview. And that still happens. It still does happen in the NFL. But in the strength sports, it doesn't happen, which I can see is a good thing, right? Because now the athlete yourself, you, you write your own narrative. Right. You can be you. Sure. Where And that authenticity is what does the best. Be you. The problem is when the other people try to be Stan, you know, yeah. or try to be Matt, or try to be Dave, or try to be Louie, or try to be somebody they're not. They yeah. can't maintain that cover, right? Now, if they, were, if they had a publisher doing it for them, the publisher can. Yeah. You, you get what I'm saying? So That's that a good point. There's two sides here that there's always gonna be good and bad, yin yeah. and yang, you know. That's a very important message that you just said. First, in, in, in retrospect, those magazines, I used to read them, I used to highlight them and bend the pages and oh, yeah. read them, and I had every single month and collected, the, you know, muscle and fitness and all those things. Then come to find out those guys didn't write any of those articles. Nope. And I was, I wrote articles for those magazines uh, uh, in, in recent years. Uh, 
And the articles are recycled and different pictures are put on the same damn articles, mm-hmm. which you come to find after you read them every single month. Uh, but, uh, you know, you hit on, on something real important there in, in conclusion about, uh, uh, no, I lost my track of thought. What did you finish up on there? Well, it was the magazines, the um, telling your own story, authenticity. Oh, yeah, authenticity. That's my biggest concern was when I started first getting into social media. Uh, I, I had obviously Mark Bell was uh, who I was training with in 2009 had kind of just started mm-hmm. doing a lot of YouTube Uh, content and has done extraordinarily well by being very consistent with that and I never really had a uh, say a personality per se Uh, like I wasn't C.T. Fletcher right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see C.T. and I watch his stuff and I'm like oh man that guy's got this particular personality and Mark Bell's kind of got that WWE thing that he grew up with and he's really good at it Mm -hmm. right and I was sitting around for a while I was thinking well how how am I going to present myself you know when I go Mm -hmm. out and start doing social media and I I don't have it I, I don't have a performance I don't have a uh, that kind of, uh, uh, I don't know what you, character mm-hmm. uh, for me. All I had was information, things that, you know, from a lot of, of, of years of competing. And so that's what I, I launched with. I was just me and I just talked about, you know, every single rant that I did uh, on YouTube and every interview that I did. I just talk about the, what I think I know, what I think I learned, what I think the research suggests, and I keep learning and, uh, and try and give that to people. And I've given away a ton of free information. I did an entire two plus hour uh, podcast on YouTube. Uh, it was a seminar up in Iceland with Hofthor Bjornsson. And I went over in with a, an overhead projector and, and over step by step went over an entire vertical diet. It's got almost 7 million views now. And my wife, after I got home from that, she's like, who's gonna buy your ebook? You just put the whole thing up there in video. Mm-hmm. And s- sure enough, it actually, sales exploded on the mm-hmm. ebook because if anybody's like me when i watch a podcast i can't remember very much of it mm-hmm. and then i got to go back and watch it again with a piece of paper and start writing things down plus there's a whole lot of you know feeling but it's a reference point you know like mm-hmm. a text that you can go to and i also didn't try and claim that i invented any of that stuff every single chapter in my book i reference the resources that i utilize the people who i think mm-hmm. are the most knowledgeable in that particular field uh, and links to their videos, their articles, and the published peer-reviewed research if you want to take mm-hmm. a deeper dive. And then I make my specific recommendations so that people can very quickly see this is exactly what, mm-hmm. I, what I recommend and why. And, and I've got you know, a host of different people in there, and like I said about, uh, uh, about Louis Simmons earlier, again, I don't claim that, that uh, I agree with everything those people mm-hmm. say, nor do I claim that those people agree with everything I say, mm-hmm. and they're in my book. Mm-hmm. You know, dozens of them, names and faces that people are familiar with in the industry. Uh, and and I, I just utilize that as, as kind of a resource. I've even suggested that just like Matt has an employee manual that, that we turned into mm-hmm. uh, a career book, that everyone should have some sort of text like, so that you aren't repeating yourself to every single client and that they have a resource that you can, can you know update which is what i do with my mm-hmm. my ebook it's a living document that i've now we've got version 3.0 and i've made some adjustments and and clarifications and nuances to things that i've recommended in the past as science has emerged or as i've gotten feedback from thousands of clients mm-hmm. over the years i said well you might want to consider this i didn't invent all that somebody brought it to my attention and i shared it with my audience uh, but i recommend that if you're even if you're a personal trainer uh, you know, at a gym, that you have some sort of document. It could be an ebook. It's pretty easy to put together. It's online, mm-hmm. so that your client has some sort of resource that they aren't kind of in the shadows, mm-hmm. having to look around and find answers to questions for everybody else. Here's everything I want you to do. Here's sleep, hydration, nutrition, digestion, mm-hmm. blood testing. Uh, you know, health markers, etc. Even a grocery shopping list and menus, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, little tips and tricks for compliance. Everybody has their own favorite palette of things that they yeah. recommend. What worked for them and, and what they've understood from their education. They should put one together. It becomes almost like a business plan. Mm-hmm. It really does. When I've had to write a business plan, it tells you a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you have to present it to a bank, or like when um, uh, I was just getting into to doing the cooler when. Uh, when Shark Tank uh, in, mm-hmm. invited me on, Shark Tank wanted an extraordinary amount of information. They wanted bank statements and, and tax returns and financial information. They also wanted a business plan, a very detailed business plan, a very complete business plan. 
I hadn't done one yet mm -hmm. on the cooler. It was a relatively new business. It tells you a lot about yourself, about your goals, about you know whether you lack procrastination, direction, procrastination, <laughs> that kind of thing. But that would, to me, be if you were to put compile everything. That's how I created the Vertical Diet 3.0 ebook. Is I just had notepads. Every time I came across information I thought was important, or I had a history of clients that I had worked with, and I just kept all of that together in my notes. And then I finally, one day, took all of the notes for all of the topics that I wanted a client to know right out of the gate, and I put them in one document. And so every time they contacted me to train them, I said, here, I need you to read this, and here's a questionnaire so I can get some specifics mm -hmm. about you and make some recommendations that are unique to you, potentially. Uh, and, and that's that's how it evolves. So the bottom line is I would recommend that, that people uh, do that exercise. I would for any business. I would ask for a business plan. Mm -hmm. What's your client's business plan uh, in, in general terms? Understanding that everybody has their own specific goals, mm -hmm. weight loss, weight gain, uh, you know, medical conditions, et cetera. So that, that's kind of a proposal that, that Matt and I make uh, to uh, our coaches as well. Yeah, because I mean, one thing we always talk about is, um, you know, on our wall it says what gets measured gets done. Yes. But if uh, it's important to keep the client focused, because you might have a client who's like, you know, we should, I wish Jason could get on here because he'd give you more stories, but you know, somebody might say, you know, uh, I want to get really strong. And then like three weeks later, it's like, I think I need to get leaner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's like, well, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's like, and then it's like, when are we going to put some weight on the bar? It's like, dude, you're. <laughs> yeah, they're all over the place. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, get, but by keeping notes, you can say, well, last week you told me this. What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. It's like a restaurant. You want steak, I'll bring you a steak. You want chicken, I'll get you chicken. You just got to tell me what mm -hmm. you want. But you can't tell me I was walking out with the steak to get me chicken. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody thinks it's a it, it's a short term thing. They don't understand the commitments that it, it sure. takes to whether it's lose weight or gain weight. It, it, it's not P ninety X. It does. Uh, not yeah, work. I mean, five years is still going to go by in five years, no matter what. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so it's easy. A lot, with that, I always tell people is think back to what your goals were five years ago. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Yeah, right. that's a good way to say it. Right? Or another way is, I mean, Christmas just passed by, but say it's September. Just Can you remember last Christmas? And everybody's like, oh, hell yeah. You realize that was 10 months ago. Right. Really? Yeah. Like, yeah, 10 months ago. You know what you can, you know how much weight you can lose in 10 months if you're just dropping a pound and a half a week? Yeah, New Year's resolutions. <laughs> yeah. I always say you can be great at anything, but you can't be great at everything. So you really do need to get people to define you what it is they want. The other thing I noticed is, People overestimate what they can do in a short amount of time and underestimate mm -hmm. what they can do. Like, to your point, though, like, you'll get somebody who's like, I want to put 100 pounds on my deadlift. Great. In six weeks, it's like, eh. Yeah. You know, but like, you can put 200 pounds on in two years if you want to. Sure. You know, if you really mm -hmm. want to make the long term commitment. I mean, Matt's a master at that. He always tries to find out. And he'll just ask them straight up, Do you have any fitness goals? Yeah. And that really opens, and they're like, Yeah, I want. And once they tell you what you want, you're golden because then you just provide them uh, a path to achieve that. Yeah. Well, whoever's talking in one of those scenarios is losing. You know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've watched. Uh, <laughs> I've watched guys try to. Matt's solicit. got a million of these in the book, by mm -hmm. the way. These, you know, these like, little quips that he says. Whoever I've watched uh, trainers try to solicit, and they'll go door to door, and they're like, oh, "We, you know, we have excellent equipment." And I'm like, and "I'll just say like, hey, where are you from?" Mm -hmm. And you let them get going because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you're probably going to screw. It's like talking to girls. Like you're yeah. probably going to screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> you're better off with them talking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The odds of you screwing up are pretty high. Yeah. Are yep. we getting into a different podcast mm -hmm. here? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's new ebook pickup advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, we're actually coming up to I think our three good, hour mark. Our three hour mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to miss a plane. Mm -hmm. So, any last words? Where can people reach you? Yeah, at. Stan Efferning's the Instagram. StanEfferning.com is my website. That's where I have links to our meal prep company. We serve uh, vertical diet meals nationwide. Monster Mash. Nobody's probably heard of that mm -hmm. by now. Uh, Stan Efferning on YouTube will get you those videos that we talked about today. And uh, there's a host of those uh, Rhino's Rants on there. But everything's at Stan Efferning. Beautiful. 
If, so, if somebody was interested in the vertical diet, would you recommend they buy the ebook from your site or they buy the book on Amazon? Selfishly speaking, I'd have to recommend the ebook again because it's more comprehensive. There was things in there I couldn't put in the book, things about you know it, more in depth about blood testing, about performance enhancing drugs, about uh, uh, strength and and um, and hypertrophy programs. It is more comprehensive. Plus, it's a living document, and I'll be updating it with version 4.0 soon. By living document, I mean that once you buy a copy of it, you get access to any subsequent updates mm -hmm. uh, that I make for it and so it uh, that's that's my recommendation but some folks really like I, I buy books and I yeah. highlight them and have them as a, as a resource as well but they're both uh, great resources you can go to uh, beatpersonaltraining.com we do uh, offer some products for trainers or it could be anybody physical therapist chiropractor somebody who's looking to make a career in the fitness industry we have some stuff that can help them out and then the, our books are on Stan site so stanefforty.com and my Instagram is Beat Trainer, but you're going to see a bunch of pictures of me and my kids. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the show. <laughs> the barbarians. <Awesome>. Yeah. <laughs> so some twin, uh, are they six now? Yeah, twin daughters. Twin six-year-old daughters. They yeah. are hilarious. God's mm -hmm. funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, for everybody in the chat, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this was episode 90 with Stan Efforting. Uh, the the rhino himself, right? That, that's it. I'm trying to drop that as I get older. It just oh, isn't. it's never going to go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, Matt, thank you very much for joining us as well. It's been an absolute blast. As always, guys, like, subscribe, do all the things, and we will see you in the next one. Awesome.